Buckle up, boys. Time to go to work. Dan Patrick. Hey there, welcome back. It's another day, another edition of the Dan Patrick Show. Is it more of an advantage if your players are testing positive now? I mean, you, you're not hoping for it, but there's a benefit to this. Bringing you the biggest guests and best interviews as Dan is joined by the four Danettes. Paulie, Seton, McLovin, and Fritzy. And not to be forgotten, amongst all this turmoil is the following statement from respected analyst Chris Mannix. How about a playoff prediction? Blazers, Sixers in the finals. <laughs> Whoa! Okay. Going to just hit that one more time to cement it into your memory. Blazers, Sixers in the finals. <laughs> Broadcasting from the Mercedes Man Cave. This is Dan Patrick. Yep, we're back. It's hour one on this Tuesday. Dan and the Danettes, Dan Patrick Show. We had a lot of fun yesterday at the expense of Bruce Smith, the Hall of Famer from the Buffalo Bills, and he was on Family Feud, and you had an interesting exchange there with Steve Harvey. Bruce Smith will join us coming up in about 20 minutes from now. We'll check in with the Lakers situation, having lost Avery Bradley and Rajon Rondo. Are they still the favorites to win the title? You can get in touch with the program a variety of ways. 877-3DP-SHOW. Email address, dp at danpatrick.com. Twitter handle at DP Show. Say good morning to chat row. Say good morning to those listening and watching on youtube.com slash the Dan Patrick Show. This program brought to you by the great folks at LegalZoom. You can start online with their network of independent attorneys. They provide advice when you need it the most. And since LegalZoom isn't a law firm, you don't have to leave your home. Visit LegalZoom.com today for more information. We've all heard the expression, maybe lived the expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Apparently, the NBA bubble is the exact opposite. What happens in the bubble will be put on social media in excruciating detail. Now, first, we were hit with a wave of players tweeting about dinner, images of their dinners. Then the media arrived, doubled down on the food, the mini bars. All right, we get it. Life in the bubble is interesting. Maybe a little difficult there. But I think with everything going on, nobody wants to hear all of the uh, complaints here. And on a more serious note, there's a lot at stake here. Hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. NBA's bubble model could end up being the best strategy of all these sports leagues. Or it could blow up in their faces. It's unbelievable to see teams working out in a hotel ballroom. It really is. They're also golfing. They're... Uh, you know, shooting beers, uh, they're fishing, they're doing all the things that you want your team to do to get ready. And all along, taking their COVID tests that are crucial to restarting the league. So I hope it all works out. Hoops begin soon. Just lay off the photos of the food for a little while, okay? Especially you, J.R. Smith. And you start to look at the number of players being tested, and right now, two positive tests in the bubble – you have Russell Westbrook Jr. the third who tested positive. James Harden hasn't gotten to Orlando yet. There's a lot of widespread speculation about James Harden and his health, but his coach Mike D'Antoni said, look, we're just hoping, and it's hope, that uh, he'll get here on time. Doesn't sound too confident, but uh, you know, that there's some questions here. And also, how much information is going to be revealed? Because when you think about it, NBA and baseball are not disclosing who has COVID. I don't think that can work for the NFL because the NFL has serious transparency protocols with gambling. If a guy goes on an injury report, what's it say? Undisclosed illness. How's, how long is he going to be out? Two weeks. COVID. Everybody's going to know, right? Right. The NBA is in the middle of a huge negotiation with legalized gambling right now. Brian Windhorst has documented this. Can the NFL do any of the extraordinary steps that the NBA is doing? Is the NBA going to make the NFL look bad here? But I think gambling is a big issue here. And what are you disclosing? What can you disclose? you got HIPAA laws here. And we talked to the Commissioner of Major League Baseball about that. Can you say if somebody is tested positive, what's the injury report say? 
in if it does say undisclosed illness, it's really saying COVID. But those are just some of the issues that we have. And granted, I know, let's look at positives here. The NBA is in the bubble, and by all accounts, it looks like they're going to be able to start on time. I don't know about the other sports leagues, but it looks like the NBA has done a pretty good job of buttoning this up. But we still have time. And there's always a knucklehead in the group who's going to do something stupid. And we've already had a couple of those. But let's hope for the best here. Hope for some action here. Some actual sports. Something that we can talk about the next day and go, did you see that last night? I, I mean, I, look, I'll take complaints about refereeing right now. Like, I, just, just give me something in front of my screen that says, hey, there's some actual sports being played. McLevin has a poll question today, I believe, or some suggestions. Well, just off that, I don't know if it's a poll question, mm-hmm. but as of today, July 14th, which strategy seems better, a bubble like the NHL and the NBA or a non-bubble like MLB and NFL? Well, I think the bubble is yeah. compare. I mean, it's not even comparable, you know, because the bubble has everybody there, has everything in there. My biggest concern with the bubble is the workers who are coming and going every single day, and how much contact are they going to have with people, with their food, with everything that you you're not even thinking about. But these people are going to be coming and going, working in the bubble. But I think the NBA's done a as good a job as you could possibly do. And keep in mind, when they put these safeguards in play, or at least they discussed them months ago, you didn't have Florida as one of the hotspots, maybe the hotspot in America for COVID. You have that going on now, and Orlando is one of the hotspots. You know, all it takes is a couple people, and if they don't follow the protocol, or you have people outside who come in back and forth, You could shut the, the league shut down with Rudy Gobert. Now, granted, we didn't know exactly where this was going, you know, what COVID really was, and we're still figuring it out. But the NBA, all the sports shut down because of Rudy Gobert testing positive. If you have a marquee player who tests positive, what does the NBA do? I know it's worst case scenario, but I got to start there and work my way back. I think I've learned from experience of where we were in March to where we are now. Let's go worst case scenario and work our way back because we've seen these leagues have gone the other way. Best case scenario, we're going to be playing in May, June, July, August. That's why I start at the end. I work my way back and I hope I'm wrong. Because the NBA, I think, has done everything they can possibly do given these trying times. And these players being accepting of going in there. But let's see what happens. You know, Florida's having, I think, you know, just imagine the weather. You can't go outside. You're going to be stuck inside. And let's say you're there. The longer, the more successful your team is, the longer you stay there. And then what's going to happen? Guy's going to be... Climbing walls there. You ever seen the movie Barton Fink? <laughs> Cohen Brothers? Where John Goodman, you, like you're stuck in there. Uh, is that John Totoro is in there as well. And it's just the, the wallpaper starts to peel. And, it, you know, this guy has writer's block and he's stuck in his hotel room. That's what I envision. Guys are going to be, they can't go to their gyms. You know, the, the writers who are there, like they're stuck in their hotel rooms. Some have access, and others are just kind of on the outside looking in. Yeah, McLovin? Playing devil's advocate, is that possibly good for an NBA player who, like, during the playoffs doesn't have to deal with any outside distractions, can just go to his room and focus on basketball? Like, you know, you always hear, like, Super Bowl week, all the guys are, like, dealing with ticket requests, and Mm. all that's gone now. (laughs) (laughs) And I had a poll question. Would you want to be stuck in a hotel room for three months with all your friends playing your favorite sport? Yes or no? If I propose that to any of us right now. Oh, you get to play. Not not a media member. You're not a media member. You're a player. Like, would you be psyched? Three, say, go, say it was golf or tennis or basketball. Would that seem appealing at all? If I got to play, yes. If I was a member of the media, no. 
And I think that would be pretty difficult because you can't just come and go as you please. And members of the media like to come and go as they please. And you can't. Now, there's strict guidelines there of what you can do and can't do. And, and people are wearing these monitors. If you come in contact with somebody six feet away, I mean, this is all really happening. When, we, when this was first discussed, we're like, wait, what? How are they going to pull this off? And here we are on the verge of maybe pulling this off. Yes, Eden. That part of it really creeps me out. The monitors and cameras and the like tracking everybody's movement. That it feels like such an invasion. This is like George Orwell. Is this nineteen eighty four, McLovin? Have you ever seen that movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise? And he walks into a gap and like the eye, all the cameras see yeah. him and all these things come into his eye. Like that's all real now. Like we're in George Orwellian Philip Dick times. Don't get me started on my sci fi guys. Yes, Paul. But you have the choice to enter the 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 bubble. You know, a lot of players didn't for multiple reasons. Well, you Health, can family. enter, but then when you leave, you can't come back. Right. I don't know. It's it's weird. People who live in Hawaii talk about this, where you co- kind of get uh, that island fever from the standpoint of you're on an island and you can't get off right away. And I, I never understood that. But if you stay long enough then you do understand what they're talking about, where you kind of go, wait a minute here, I'm, I'm on this island. Granted, it's a beautiful island, but you're like, I'm on an island here. I don't know if these players are going to feel that way, but the more successful, I think the more stress that's going to be added. Now you're going to remove a lot of these players and these teams, and that's a, a large number of people. The more successful you are, these teams that are eliminated, but still... You're going to be there for three months. Yeah, McLeod. So the NBA has everything that Seton was talking about, all these bells and whistles, but the NFL has none of this. So how is the NFL going to contain the virus? I have no idea. If the NBA can barely contain it with all this technology. And I go back to, and I don't know, once again, I don't even know what day it is, but when I told you that the NFL was looking at extending their face mask, and now you see the protocols, or the uh, prototypes, they have these and the, now you have players that say, if I have to wear that, I'm not playing. Remember, LeBron wasn't playing if there weren't fans. He walked that back. J.J. Uh, Watt said he's not playing if he has to wear this certain kind of shield. Okay, let's wait. But you might be walking that back as well. They're trying to do the best they can. But I think the NFL has a monumental task, and college football a monumental task, to try to pull this off. The NBA, they have a plan. I think they've carried it out as well as possible. But we know that you're only as strong as your weakest link. And that could be the people coming and going, just trying to hold on to a job. Yeah, Paul. JJ doesn't even like wearing the helmet. You know, he would go with Sans <laughs> helmet if he could. Show off the moneymaker. A few black eyes and blood. Uh, let me see. What else do we have? The Redskins name changes on hold. There's trademark issues. And I think what happened is, I'm not going to say it was uh, uh, erroneous reporting, but it felt like people were jumping the gun saying, oh, the Redskins are announcing that they're changing their name. Therefore, there's going to be a name change. No, they were retiring the Redskins nickname. I don't even like that. Like they're retiring it. How about we just extinguish it? Just do away with it. I mean, people are going to always have it in their memory bank. If you're a diehard Redskins fan, you know, it's going to be, that's going to be your team there. But if Daniel Snyder, I, I, I said it somewhat jokingly, how does Daniel Snyder screw this up? There's that possibility here. But uh, no, uh, no name change yet, uh, trademark issues. Somebody went out and trademarked all of the possibilities here. Um Got athletes joining A-Rod and J-Lo's bid to buy the Mets. Uh, So where Brian Urlacher, our good buddy, was uh, throwing in some uh, spare change. How much money do you put in? Like how much is you got to put in this amount if you want to be part of the investment group? Is it your level of fame? Like if you're more famous, do you have to give less because they want you? Well, like DeMarco Murray. How much money is DeMarco Murray going to put in? I know he's got some money. Urlacher's got that vitamin water money, doesn't he? I think I think Urlacher got in on vitamin water. Oh, and that restore hair money. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, well, I think the vitamin water. Oh, bigger. <laughs> yes, Todd. And what's the minimum percentage of ownership that you have to have where you can make some uh, wheeling and dealing, or at least make a suggestion about trying to grab that middle reliever from Minnesota? Or they don't want to hear from Travis Kelsey about his idea to get that young outfielder. Yeah, Travis Kelsey's involved in it as well with Brian Urlacher. I, I can't imagine that Urlacher would be part of the decision makers there, but A-Rod and J-Lo trying to uh, buy the New York Mets. Sure, why not? Like, I got other things to worry about. <laughs> it's like, and, and people are, you know, because they love the Mets, and certainly in the New, you know, New York area, the, uh, the tri-state area here in the Northeast, can you believe A-Rod would be buying the Mets? And I go, yeah, sure, why not? I couldn't care less. And, you know, he's, uh, he's the face of the franchise. If that's the face you want, I'd rather have J-Lo as the face, but if you want A-Rod as the face, then, you know. Go ahead. We got other things to worry about. Like the things that I used to worry about, I go, yeah, sure, I don't care. <laughs> I just. Showering. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I got the same shorts on I had on yesterday. They look good yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Look yeah. slimming. <laughs> so I just said, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, I'm don't mess good. With, don't mess with the streak. Yeah, because yeah, my wife goes, do you wear those yesterday? I go, yeah, had a pretty good day. Yeah, doing okay. Yeah, McLovin. Did the Mets just hire Carlos Beltran too and have to fire sure, him immediately? Sure, yeah, yeah, bring him back. The, yeah, yeah, bring and him back. And he's supposed to be awesome. That's a shame they had to fire him. He's supposed to be a great up and coming manager. Mm. I mean, yeah. He's not worse than a Rod. Uh, no, probably. I, I mean, <laughs> varying degrees of cheating. So Carlos Beltran helped win a World Series by cheating, and a Rod used steroids to he win got a World Series twice. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um. All right, well, you know, I'll leave that up to Major League Baseball. They got other things to worry about, too, than is A-Rod going to be. And plus, you don't have to have the highest bid to get the team because there's this hedge fund guy, Steve Cohen, and he's got billions. And he could I, he could just plunk down $4 billion and say, scoreboard. But baseball has to vet this out, and that doesn't mean that the guy who has the most money is going to get the team. Uh, did we decide on a poll question? I want to. I want to play this Bruce Smith. Uh, I have a couple Bruce Smith related polls that we should probably do before he comes on. Oh, pardon the pun. Yeah, <laughs> this is. Well, one of them. What is the? <laughs> this is going to sound wrong. What is a tool you use the most in your daily life? <laughs> now that sounds so wrong, but I was going to say hammer <laughs> wrench or screwdriver because I know you guys are big home improvement guys. I, it's a legit question. I don't think anybody in here is a big home improvement guy. I could probably take this one. That would be the uh, the wrench. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. <laughs> we all watch home improvement on TV. Does that make us oh, home yeah. improvement guys? No. I watched the uh, main cabin masters. That's about it. Yeah, see. I probably use a tape measure once a day. C constantly measuring <laughs> different things in my house. Okay. Yeah. We're not talking like in the Bruce Smith. I'm not not in the category. Bruce Smith way. No, no I'm pretty. <laughs> That hasn't changed. I've been, uh, been aware of that since, uh, you know, seventh grade. The exchange yeah. uh, on <laughs> fam Celebrity Family Feud with Bruce Smith and uh, Steve Harvey. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we're having Bruce on. Uh, so this was the exchange on uh, the Celebrity Family Feud on Sunday. If Captain Hook was moonlighting as a handyman, he might replace his hook with what tool? A hammer. Try again. A penis. Tell me the age a kid is too old to sleep with a tent. What the f did he say? <laughs> all right, all right. So it it's still it's still funny. It's still funny. There's so many other choices. Tons. I'm gonna give him an opportunity to give me a correct answer. How's that? I'm gonna I'm gonna re ask Bruce the question and see if he can come up with it. I thought your your line, Paul, and made me laugh out loud yesterday. What if it came up on the screen? Uh, two people pick penis. Ding 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 ding. ding. Two responses. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed out loud. I was sitting at dinner with my family. I just started laughing, and then uh, my son goes, "What's so funny?" I go. I'll tell you later. <laughs> I'll tell you later. He's old enough now, you can tell. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Quick, Bruce, hurry up, order. Uh, <laughs> I'll have a hamburger. No, penis. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're all on, they're all on a hamburger. <laughs> Bruce, who was your favorite teammate playing with the Bills? Jim Kelly. 
No, he's already taken uh, uh, Andrew, a penis. <laughs> uh, Thurman, uh, Thurman Thomas. Thurman Thomas. Thurman penis. Quick, I just got to say, a penis. <laughs> Gerald Talley. Uh, ah. Yeah, right back in there. Uh, yep. <sighs> 24 hours later, we're right back where we started. All right, we'll take a break here. We'll come up with a poll question. Bruce Smith will join us coming up next. It's 21 after the hour. This is the Dan Patrick Show. Uh, I've told you about Full Sail University, and I went into business with them. Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, an accelerated bachelor's degree designed to teach you all the aspects of sportscasting, front of the camera, behind the camera, podcasting, radio, everything in between. Your degree is in sportscasting. I didn't want it to be broadcasting. I didn't want it to be communications. If you want to do this, we wanted to teach you everything you need to know. And one of the reasons why I chose them as partners, their approach to education. And uh, they have hands-on learning, a faculty that, that has real-world experience to prepare students for what life is really like in the industry. People who have been on the front lines, whether you're a coordinating producer, producer, an executive, somebody who's been on the air, that's what I wanted. Directors, camera operators. At Full Sail, you can earn your bachelor's degree in about half the time as short as 20 months. You can earn your degree online. And we have some great students who have uh, been working on their degrees online. Or on campus, Orlando, Florida, Full Sail's campus there. To learn more about the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, go to fullsail.edu slash danpatrick. was bothered by your impersonation of them. This is a good segue for me because I want to say something about Keith Jackson. This was the, the, inter, the impression that got me so to call national attention was Letterman. Letterman had me on and uh, he wanted to just do Keith Jackson. Now I had heard, I don't know if we have the sound effect. Will we have the sound effect behind me if I ask for it? Uh, of Keith Jackson. There it is. Let me do it for you right now. Well, hello, get about it. This is Keith Jackson. This is Cottage <laughs> Football 2019, and who, oh, Nelly, we've got a real barn burner for you. Yes, indeed, it did it live. It'll be ABC's Wide World of Sports with the proctologist from Johns Hopkins University, <laughs> taking on the big red suicide machine from Jack Kevorkian Junior College. <laughs> and oh boy, there's going to be a whole lot of head crack. Let's pick up the action right here, right now on ABC. He rolls on the right side. He's got some run from the 35 to 30 to 25. He could go all the way, but he's hit and cracked and fumbled. <laughs> and that's the way he sounded, right? Now, Letterman hears this. I do it on national TV, and I hear that Keith is pissed. Yes. But he wasn't really pissed. He wasn't sure what my attitude was towards him. Well, he did tell me, he goes, I never said. I never said, whoa, Nelly. Yeah. No, sir. <laughs> but here's, here's the beautiful thing. We became really close friends at the end. And he, he will you do Keith Jackson for me? <laughs> right? <laughs> when, he pass, when he passes, when he passes, when he passes, his longtime wife, I think they were 65 years married, or maybe almost 70 years married, 60-something years, she said, would you do Keith at the memorial? And I, and I did. I did a memorial, Keith. Wow. And, and it just gave everybody a laugh, and it was warm. But Keith used That's to say, pressure, Roy. I, never, I never said woe nearly, but I do like the way that he does Keith Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. True story. Did Cosell ever respond to you doing Cosell? Oh, many times. We, I had about was he a, okay with that? No. 
<laughs> he wasn't okay with anything. It he felt wasn't like, right. I had. Do, can we get that hip hop thing up before I do this? This is. I wanted to do Howard Cosell and Muhammad Ali as hip hop. I need a little more t sound in the, the headphones. Headphones. Okay. Here is Howard Cosell and Muhammad Ali. A little more. Here we go. Here we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Howard Cosell. Without further ado, there's the opening bell. <laughs> We're here today to view and observe a three-time champ with a hell of a nerve. He fought all comers with speed and savvy, though in later years, he got kind of flabby. Ladies and gentlemen, Muhammad Ali. Now, Howard Cosell, I hear what you say. You're full of hot air, you got a bad toupee. I fought with style, I fought with class. You ain't nothing but a pain in my ass. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> but Cosell, just to say that I, in the 1981 World Series, Dodgers, Yankees, I go in the dugout and I do this. That, my friend, was not an authentic impersonation. <laughs> now, if you do Keith Jackson, that's quite a different thing. I mean, he, he, he liked it when you lampooned others, but not himself. We'll get to your phone calls, come up with a poll question. And once again, it's kind of dangerous territory to even talk about what is being speculated by those covering the Houston Rockets about why James Harden is not in Orlando. We know Russell Westbrook tested positive. Russell Westbrook did come out and talk about the COVID virus, and he did say, hey, this is no joke here. So he's acknowledged that publicly. We haven't heard anything from James Harden. But we assume that he is uh, en route to Orlando at some point. But uh, Joe Varden, who covers the NBA for The Athletic, he'll join us coming up in about an hour. Get an idea of what's life like in the bubble. How much access do you have to these players? And are the Lakers still the team to beat? Because I think there's a little bit more debate today than there has been about the Lakers. Without Rondo and without Avery Bradley and who's going to step up, do you have enough depth there? And you got you still got Dion Waiters and J.R. Smith, and I have no idea what you're going to get with those two. And I don't think the Lakers do as well. Yeah, Paul. A couple months ago, you were talking about the Lakers, and you said that uh, if, if LeBron and the Lakers win the title in that order, yeah. he will get uh, dinged because it wasn't a full season. It was this weird mishmash of a tournament at the end of the season. Any chance it goes the other way? Let's say two months from now, the Lakers are the champs and LeBron's the MVP. LeBron gets extra credit for losing two players <laughs> and doing it on a neutral site because he didn't have home court advantage. The degree of difficulty is greater, but he, LeBron never gets extra credit. He should. In this specific situation, it's almost a fact that it's a tougher road. But you have members of the media who openly don't like LeBron or question his greatness, his clutchness, uh, that he's not anywhere near Michael Jordan. And I, it just feels like, because that gives LeBron four titles. Now, all of a sudden, you get into dangerous territory for those who are Michael Jordan sycophants who are going to defend that at every, you know, at every step. If LeBron gets to four, then you're going to start having a real conversation about greatest player of all time, even though it's a, a unwinnable argument if you're a LeBron James fan. It just is. You can't, you can't beat 6-0. and oh. You can't be Jordan's legacy, his image. You can't. Uh, but LeBron is going to have numbers, titles. He just won't have the aura of Michael Jordan. And plus, you always remember your first love. So many people fell in love with Jordan, and nobody can come close to that. And then you put out this docuseries that came, you know, 10-part series, and people fell back in love, and then people that maybe thought they were in love with LeBron realized Hey, that's the real deal, Michael Jordan. Yeah, McLevin. I saw a video of LeBron and Anthony Davis working out yesterday. I got to tell you, Anthony Davis looks, I don't know that, Le and this is not a slight of LeBron, like I don't know that he's clear 1A on that team because Anthony Davis looks unbelievable right now. He's really, I mean, 
I know you're <laughs> laughing at me, but like you're the Anthony Davis guy too. Well, you I know were the one Anthony, who told us Anthony Davis is great. We we know that he, he was the Greek freak before the Greek freak. Yeah, I think he could be a real problem in these playoffs <laughs> for people. Like he's even, one of the top five players in the game. He better be a real problem. Yes, Seaton. But why, if he's a top five player in the game, right, and he's awesome, why isn't he exciting? Well, nobody says you have to be, you know, exciting to be great. But don't you kind of... Like kind Tom of do, Brady though. is not exciting. He's pretty boring. No, I get, like, you're right, Tim Duncan was great, but yeah. he was pretty boring. It just seems so strange to be one of the best players in the game, but kind of, like, boring. He is up on the, you know, not all-time boringly great players. All boring team? Yeah, the all boring team. Yes, McLovin. Yeah, ESPN would air Zion practicing over oh, they Anthony would. Davis playing. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> just, what, would you rather watch the Lakers play or Zion practice? And you probably have a lot of people that say, oh, I'll definitely watch Zion practice. Yeah, McLovin. I also thought when Rondo and Avery Bradley, isn't LeBron going to be bringing the ball up when it matters anyway? <laughs> like, that was my, I guess you'll get into it with Joe Varden, but isn't he sort of the point guard in crutch time anyway? Yeah, but I still want depth. I, I just want bodies there because this is a game of attrition here. You know, injuries and if somebody happens to get sick. You just want to have a, as full a roster, complete a roster as you can. Plus, you get guys in roles that they're comfortable with. Your rotations that you're comfortable with. And Frank Vogel, who's done an unbelievable job this year. So now your rotations change a little bit. Your strategy changes a little bit. And I have a little bit more confidence in Rajon Rondo and Avery Bradley than I do J.R. Smith and Deion Waiters. Yeah, McLeod. I also, I see a lot of Paul George practicing too. Like the Clippers get healthy. That's a huge plus. This is a big moment for Paul George. Like Paul George, we kind of lump in and go, man, Paul George, one of the great players in the game. Okay. I want to see it when we get to playoff time here. Playoff Paul. I like to see it. Uh, Kawhi's done it. He's done it on a couple of big stages. This, to me, is more about Paul George than it is Kawhi Leonard. I expect Kawhi to be great. It just, that's that's who he is, his mindset. He gets plugged in, and he just goes. Doesn't have to do anything else. He just plays. He picks you up on both ends of the floor. You know, he's offense, defense. He's great, and I have no issues with him. I am a little concerned about uh, Paul George and the uh, Clippers. All right, uh, is uh, Bruce Smith set to join us there, uh, Fritzy? Bruce, can you hear me? I can hear you, Dan. It's it's faint, but I can hear you. All right, let me give the full introduction here. Uh, Hall of Famer, former uh, Buffalo Bills and Washington Redskins defensive lineman, and uh, NFL all-time sack leader, 11 Pro Bowls, and uh, one defensive player of the year a couple of times, and, of course, a big TV star after what we saw with uh, Celebrity Family Feud on Sunday. <laughs> now, when did you shoot that, Bruce? Uh, Dan, first of all, thanks for having me on, my sh on your show. And it's uh, always good to see you since the last time we played golf. Out oh, Lake okay. Tahoe. Now, we played in Tahoe a couple of years ago. Bruce had a golf bag that rivaled Rodney Dangerfield in, uh, <laughs> in uh, Caddyshack. And I felt bad for your caddy because that guy labored all day carrying that bag. It looked like it weighed about 50 pounds, though. But, yeah, we had fun that day with Jaws. Yeah, we, we, we had we had a great time out there. Um, we actually filmed the show uh, in m the middle of February this year. And uh, it, it, it was quite the reunion. You know, anytime you get uh, uh, multiple Hall of Famers together with with the same type of personalities, uh, it, it, it's always a great t time. And I, I got to tell you, the Family Feud and the NFLPA put together a great list, Orlando Pace, Michael Irving, um, uh, Kevin Green, and CC Chris Carter. We had a fabulous time. Uh, so when did you know, like, did you have any idea that this was going to come out? Did I have any idea? I'm sorry. That that the video clip with Steve Harvey was going to come out? That on social yes, media? Yes, we were we were made aware that the, that the uh, show was going to come out. Uh, but during the taping of it, um, we had to stop the show multiple <laughs> times because of uh, my wild pitch, my wild pitch answer. And uh, Steve Harvey did what only Steve Harvey can do. 
he uh, <laughs> took it and hit it out of the ballpark. Okay. Did this happen before? So that that's not the first time you did something on Family Feud that you had to restart again because of you? Uh, it was one time it was a technical difficulty on their fault. Oh, okay. The second time it was uh, the second and third time it was my fault because of the answer, because everyone was in stitching and they were laughing so hard. And Steve just stopped the whole show and did about a 15-minute uh, comedy session for the audience. And I, I tell you, we just couldn't stop laughing. It was so funny. And 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 the way Steve's response was and, and the facial expressions that he gave, it, it was priceless. Well, this is how a portion of it sounded. Bruce Smith on Celebrity Family Feud. If Captain Hook was moonlighting as a handyman, he might replace his hook with what tool? A hammer. Try again. A penis. Tell me the age a kid is too old to sleep with a ten. What the <laughs> <he said? laughs> oh, Okay, Bruce. What were you thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. That, that was the problem. I couldn't think at that point in time. You know, there, there's something about... There is something about... A, a time clock and a buzzer <laughs> that it, it it makes you become confused uh, w when you're <laughs> running out of time and you don't have an answer. Uh, I gave the number one answer originally, and then when that buzzer went off a couple of times, I I, I guess I kind of panicked. <laughs> but but Bruce, of all the things you can mention in a toolbox, you mentioned a penis. <laughs> Hey, hey, but Dan, let, now let's 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 go back a little bit. Okay. As we were filming the show, there were multiple questions where all they talked about was sex. They were Michael Irving was talking about uh, his wife, and and he she was playing the role of a, an assistant in the office. Uh, there there was another question uh, pertaining to to to. Uh, to sex, and so I was already <laughs> hot wired to, to to potentially give that answer. I just needed the, the you know, the time and the space. What, what kind of reaction have you gotten? Have, have your uh, former teammates beaten you up a little bit? Oh my goodness, man! They they uh, they <laughs> they were in stitches. They just they were dying laughing while the show was going on, and, and I kept telling them that it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And and there's a climax that's coming here. And, uh, <laughs> Wait, uh, you don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, hey, Dan. See, the, the, see, the, 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 the real talk about this is, you know, we're, we're living in some difficult times right now, whether it's the, the virus, the racial tensions, and, 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 and so many other difficulties in life. Everyone needs a good laugh, and I, I, <laughs> think, I, I think this this <laughs> provided a good laugh for everyone that watches Family Feud. All right, I'm going to call a false start penalty, and I'm going to ask you the question again so you can get it right, okay? All right, sounds good. Okay. If Captain Hook was moonlighting <laughs> as a handyman, he might replace his hook with what tool? A wrench. Yeah, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were joking about it yesterday. If we were working on a car and I asked you to take something out of the toolbox, I would be afraid what you would have grabbed, given your answer on a yeah. family feud. So, uh, yeah, yeah, some 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 of my guys uh, text me back and said, we, we, we can't use this toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got you at right at two hundred sacks all time, is that right? Yeah, that that's uh, the regular season. Uh, there's I think fourteen or somewhere around fourteen more in the uh, in the playoffs. But yes, two hundred career regular sacks. If I could show one, and I said that was Bruce Smith, just one sack. Which one would you pick? Oh wow, uh, there there's there's some very memorable ones and and some of some of my favorites uh, obviously you know the the names that that really stick out are dan marino and john elway and joe montana uh but 
you know, one of the highlights uh, was the safety in the end zone against uh, the Giants and Jeff Hostetler. Okay. In the Super Bowl. Uh, I've got – you sacked Ken O'Brien more than any other quarterback with the Jets. Yes. That's not right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. They they were in the division. We played them twice a year. And, and uh, so uh, I uh, – I became very familiar with uh, <laughs> being in their backfield. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Who didn't you get? Uh, I, there's a long laundry list of them. So, Oh, uh, no. I, I, uh, you, yeah. There has to be one. No, a long, no, I mean a long laundry list of players that I did get, quarterbacks oh, yes, that I did that, get. That is true. I yeah, got them all in front said, of me. I got them all in oh, front of me. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I, Bubby Brister. Aaron Brooks, Scott Campbell, Cody Carlson, Kelly Stoffer, <laughs> Sean Moore. Are some of these guys still alive? <laughs> I have no idea, <laughs> Bruce. Uh, Donovan McNabb, Chad Hutchinson, uh, Bucky Richardson, uh, B- Bernie Kosar. Man, I, this is like a who's who of the position there. Yeah. How would you do if you played now in your prime? How many sacks? Well, I, I think since since the game has evolved and they're throwing the ball roughly 30% more yeah. in this era of football, uh, I think I would do extremely well, particularly if I played in a 4-3 defense uh, and particularly if there was another dominant pass rusher that, that was on the line of scrimmage with me. Um, I, I Playing in that 3-4 defense, obviously um, – uh, it, it's very difficult to get to the quarterback because um, it's easier to get a double team or a second or a third hat on on that uh, dominant defensive player. But uh, I, I think I would fare very well in this this era of football. No, oh, I'm sure you would too. If invited, will you go back on Family Feud? Absolutely. Okay. A- absolutely. I, I I might give you another doozy though. I can't make any promises. <laughs> you look great. You look like you could give me maybe five to ten plays. That's about it. <laughs> uh, hey, thanks for being a good sport. And uh, I wasn't surprised you came on. Um, and I enjoyed our time when we played golf together. And uh, keep smiling, Bruce. It's great to talk to you. Same here, Dad. Let, Dan, let's let's spread a little love around the world, man. We need it right now. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'll just stay away from your toolbox. But thank you, Bruce. There you go. All right. All right take That's care. Uh, the great Bruce Smith, Hall of Famer, 200 career sacks. We'll take a break. We'll come back. Play of the day right after this. I know there were a couple of times that you had some guests who probably wanted to take a swing at. I remember Barry, oh, Barry Switzer very good. had a problem with you. Yes, I talked about white trash. I don't even know how I got into this. Stupid... Because this was about how he grew up. As a bootlegger. But why did you use the expression white I, trash? I don't know, Dan. I'm an idiot, that's why. Because... I just said, you know, people would say that you grew up in a period with your family in trailer park, white trash. And he goes, what do you mean by white trash? And I'm, uh, he's get, I ought to punch you right in the mouth. And I went, whoa, th- this was, do you ever get any physical moments where people are rude and, or they think you're rude? Or- A-Rod. A-Rod. And Lawrence Taylor. Really? Yeah. Well, I had Ted Turner on one time, and it was the day he was debuting his 24-hour music channel, and they didn't tell me that they were pulling the plug that day. And I said, and he comes on the show. The theme is rolling. Dun, dun, that's hot, Clark. Sports look. Uh, Ted Turner, right? I said, Ted, tell us about this 24 hour. He goes, You're trying to make, you're trying to embarrass me, aren't I? I went, What? I didn't even know that they, they pulled the plug in that moment. He gets up and he leaves. Kevin Johnson got up and left, pulled his mic. But, you know, we were lucky because we were taping. Yeah. But in some cases, the bird was waiting and we didn't, meaning the satellite, we didn't have a backup guest. So it was like live anyway. Tom Watson one time got angry at me for asking about a, previous mayor no it's ben crenshaw i should say ben crenshaw he says you know do you talk to me about anything you want and he said well you talked no, about it, right they just say well you know there was some hardship and a tough divorce and, and then he says i want that show pulled for I, it's already it's already airing 
And he got mad at me. I'll never talk to you. You know, I had that kind of stuff, you know. But to, but to stay, uh, you know, curious. I loved hard. it. I loved it. You know, I mean. But it's I, only a, it's a half hour show. Like, I, my challenge is this is three hours. And the energy level for three hours yeah. is exhausting. Yeah. Like, I look for the little breaks there. And, you know, when you do it, and then how much, how much did you go as scripted when you were interviewing people? Never. And, I never had a script. Never. I, have, I would have a word, you know, father, suicide, or whatever the heck we were talking about, or, you know, mother, drug addict, or whatever it was, to remind myself that was the scenario. But I remember I had Shannon Sharp on. You, you ever have Shannon? I know he's at Fox now, but... Todd does a good Shannon Sharp in person. Let me hear Todd. I think the Denver Broncos got to get a new quarterback. <laughs> it's not working out with Flacco. I don't know what they're always doing. They got to get a quarterback. Very good. <laughs> I said, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen... I said, I said, uh, Shannon, based on your academic, he was a very self-effacing guy. I said, based on your academic career, would you say you graduated to the level of magna cum laude? He says, Roy, the fact that I graduated is, thank you, Lordy. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was, you can't, you can't write better no, you than can't. that. No, you can't. And Jimmy V was, came to play. Jimmy V was Wilt Chamberlain. I got to give me a quick Wilt. One, okay. Oh, 30 seconds. Okay. Wilt, sorry. Come out of a restaurant. I never met him before. 79. He's got a white Rolls Royce convertible, two dogs, Great Dane Dalmatians, as big as horses, beautiful blonde, because at the time, and this is before the Me Too, he says, you know, I was the all-time leading scorer. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I wink, said, oh, wink. okay, Wilt, okay, Wilt. Yeah. So I go to, and I had never met Wilt but he's wearing his silver and pur purple jump, silver and purple silk jumpsuit with a burgundy beret. He's got a lemon lined feather, I'll never forget this, African, uh, orange uh, wraparound sunglass, African walking stick, no shoes backed up against the steering wheel. I said, Wilt Chamberlain, you're 7'2", you're 325 pounds. Look at this getup you have here. Would you like to come on and do the show? He says, Roy, I'd like to come do the show, but right now I'm trying to keep a low profile. <laughs> 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 can't write it. You can't write it. I'm back. I'm rejuvenated. I had a great vacation. Thank you for asking. Everybody out there who's been asking how my vacation was, it was great. We got some mail. That's what I'm gonna do. Got a shark hat. I'm gonna put it on. What do you think of that? Like that? We got a calendar here. Somebody says, I'm sure Mario's thrilled to see another calendar uh, to be signed. Sorry, it's too late, so you're not gonna get this back. Scott, kidding, we'll get this back to you at some point. Uh, audible ale, tap. Got an audible ale tap, look at that. But I think this needs to be signed. We got some sort of blanket situation here. I think this is from a chat rower. Tyler tells me it's from Andrea, so. So we got a blanket. I think this is for Penny. Look at that. And then some fly fish stuff. Look at that. Dan, do you want to go fly fishing? Uh, what else do we got? I think that's it. I only got five seconds. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Play. The play is called play of the day. Runner left side, got it! We're going to play it and play it. This is the play of the day. Check this out. Gonzalez got his foot in front of it. Blanco able to keep it in play. Blanco trying to round the corner. Still Sebastian Blanco and he scores! Did not give up on that play. Blanco adding a goal to his assist. It's 2-0 for Portland. Portland Timber defeat the LA Galaxy. MLS returned last Wednesday, playing a tournament style in their own bubble in Orlando. That's courtesy of the Mothership Play of the Day. Play of the Day brought to you by Raycon. Buy Raycon.com slash Patrick. You'll love these wireless earbuds. The way to go. Get 15% off your Raycon order. Buy Raycon.com. Buy Raycon.com slash Patrick. Uh, Steve in Florida joins us. Good morning, Steve. What's on your mind? Good morning, Dan. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, I'm glad to see you guys back and everything safely. Um, the Lakers 
Kyle Kuzma has got to step up his game uh, for them to do anything in the playoffs. And then I got a question for Nick Lovin. Um, trivia que- um, poll question. Hmm. Dan Patrick, who would you rather interview for 30 minutes? LeBron James, Tom Brady, or Bill Belichick? No holds barred. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. Well, I've interviewed Brady and I've interviewed LeBron. It, when, when You know, if Belichick was going to be the Belichick we always hear about, well, he's funny and he loves to tell stories, but he's not going to do that with me. Um, I, f- I thought Brady was sneaky great. But I, I do think, you know, he he's a little more buttoned up. Now, you know, he went on Howard Stern and, you know, that was fair game, it felt like. He went on knowing that if you're going into Howard Stern's studio, that you have to play by his rules. I probably do LeBron James now just because, you know, is there a bigger athlete on the planet? And a lot has changed since the last time we spoke to him. But uh, I, I probably say LeBron James. If it's no holds barred, yeah, you know, LeBron James. Because I don't know what Brady, you know, Brady and, and Derek Jeter, there's certain athletes that they kind of went out of their way to not really tell you something while being very polite in not telling you something. Belichick is not polite in not telling you something. He just doesn't want to tell you anything. I think LeBron wants to tell you something, and sometimes he'll tell you more than he actually thinks he's telling you, if that makes sense. Um. I I was looking at the stats here for uh, the most career sacks by a player on one team is Bruce Smith, 171. He had 200 sacks total regular season because he played for Washington. Second on the list is Michael Strahan, had 141 and a half sacks. Terrell Suggs, 132 and a half. LT had 132 and a half. Jason Taylor had 131 with uh, the Dolphins. I don't know at what point, because the numbers tend to blur. You know, it used to be if you got 10,000 yards as a running back, you were in the Hall of Fame. And that's not the case. And I don't know if it's good, you know, because it's tougher to have running backs get those totals. Do we then look at how important are your receiving yards, receptions, those kind of things? So I think we're, we're, we're redefining what the value long-term value, Hall of Fame value of a running back is. But, you know, some of these guys with their stats, with what they're doing, you know, guys were getting big numbers and you weren't throwing the ball 40 times in a game. And that's where Bruce Smith said it's 30% more pass attempts. Therefore, you get 30% more opportunities to sack the quarterback. You don't have the seven-step drop. You're in the gun and you're going to be getting the ball away in less than two seconds. It's, in some ways, it is harder to get sacks. But there's more opportunities to get those sacks. It's just they're not there very long. It's They get it, and it goes. Whereas it used to be seven-step drop, and you were throwing the ball deep. That's not the case anymore. Now, you're going to see that. Lamar Jackson, I mean, this is why New England brought in Cam Newton. One of the reasons is you want to still give the threat, the dual threat, and you want to take some deep shots. That's who Lamar Jackson is. He's going to he's going to keep you honest at the line of scrimmage because you have to respect the run, but he's going to, if you get defensive backs, the safety, if you start to creep up a little bit, he's going to take a home run shot. And I think that's what you're going to get out of Cam Newton. And I'm excited about Cam Newton. I think it's great because I think the Patriots would have been exceedingly boring this year. There would be no, you know, because it was about legacy there and getting back to a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, time was running out. You don't get that feeling. Now Cam Newton coming in, I think it's great. And I don't know Jared Stidham, and if he's better than Cam and he gets a chance to start, great. Bring in the, a whole new era. But Cam Newton, Cam Newton with a chip on his shoulder. Gonna be a whole lot of fun. Whole lot of fun. If we have a season. We'll check in on the NBA bubble. Joe Varden and the Athletic will join us coming up. We'll get to more phone calls coming up. Settle on our poll question as well. 
Dan Patrick Show. Look what I got for you. I got I got you a t-shirt. Ah, oh, that's great. See? Yeah, thank and you. and I got it large. And so I, <laughs> Double X. <laughs> no, 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 no. I th- you've been slimming so down. Tight. No, no, that's a loose jacket. No, oh, it is? that's great. Yeah. No, I'm not slimming down. In fact, when I was putting my socks on, I think yesterday I went, what the hell is happening? What is happening? Because I play so much basketball. Yeah. Why, why would my body do this? But but don't you take care of yourself? I do. I try to eat right. I eat uh, very good egg white omelet every day. But when you did the water boy. Yeah, I was in shape. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm getting older. I don't know what to do. I'm getting old. Huh? What, Paul? We were all just saying four months ago you were on the basketball court all over the place. I, I, I can do that. I just, my body's not looking like it should. My shoulders are perfect. I have very strong shoulders, <laughs> great tricep muscles. That's great. Biceps are getting softer. And my... Uh, and we get to see you. I got the, the shirt off in the movie. Yeah. yeah. I look all right. Oh, well. <laughs> it, it, yeah, like all right. Yeah, I look all right. Like He's all right, I guess. No, I felt better. I, guess, uh, I felt sure. better about myself when I saw <laughs> you with your shirt off. Man, the socks thing, though, the other day, you would have felt great about you. It was like this, I guess, the lean over. My like you chest couldn't. is soft now. <laughs> I have a softer chest than I used to have. I used to have, like, that was part of my, the greatness of me, was this perfectly chiseled, cut down the middle yeah. chest. Yeah. And now it's becoming just one mound of uh, chest. Used to be two chests. Two chests. <laughs> two chests. <chestuses? laughs> two chests. I give Sandler a t shirt. Oh, oh, he left it. Oh, wow. Mr. Actor Guy. Just throw it out the window. Wow. Mean Let me have somebody run. That is mean spirited. That's weak. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I want you to slim down. That's really heartbreaking. <laughs> there you go. I was in the war. <laughs> okay. That's great. <laughs> oh. It's it awesome. I love it. The talent behind yeah. the dress. It's the best. Get. All right, Mario's doing this from the back. Here is Cam. You know what makes this different? <laughs> Starts with a big loogie. It is. They ain't never seen this Cam. They ain't never seen him. How do you know that, Cam? Sure, because you want to know how I know? Yeah. <laughs> I ain't never seen him. Oh. The forgotten cam, though. The shit on cam, though. Tired of being sick of tired cam. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like I was just left to die. You know what I'm saying? Just, 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 just. It's over with for him. He ain't the same player. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tell him, Cam. You know Tell him, Cam. Different. I'd watch this movie. Right? That's Look a good preview. He is. He is. Have you ever seen anyone this much? They ain't never seen this. It looks like he's wearing they all kinds of pants. They never seen this game. Todd? Because I ain't never seen this game. Todd's arms are bigger. Totally looks like he's wearing I love the uh, sick and tired of being sick and tired game. That's a good one. Yeah, that, that dude. That made me laugh. Yes! <laughs> Can I see an you MRI of his shoulder? <laughs> You know what I'll say? The MRI of yeah. the. Uh, I like to see. <laughs> I like to see a scope of his inner yeah. shoulder area. That'll do it.
Buckle up, boys. Time to go to work. Dan Patrick. Hey there, welcome back. It's another day, another edition of the Dan Patrick Show. Is it more of an advantage if your players are testing positive now? I mean, you, you're not hoping for it, but there's a benefit to this. Bringing you the biggest guests and best interviews as Dan is joined by the four Danettes. Pauly, Seton, McLovin, and Fritzy. And not to be forgotten, amongst all this turmoil is the following statement from respected analyst Chris Mannix. How about a playoff prediction? Blazers, Sixers in the finals. <laughs> Whoa! Okay. Gonna just hit that one more time to cement it into your memory. Blazers, Sixers in the finals. <laughs> Broadcasting from the Mercedes Man Cave, this is Dan Patrick. Hour two on this Tuesday, Dan and the Danettes, Dan Patrick Show. Glad to have you on board. We talked to Bruce Smith last hour. He, of course, gave us something to smile about. Celebrity family feud where Steve Harvey asked him a question and Bruce couldn't come up with the answer. And the only answer he could come up with on family feud was penis. So uh, Bruce, being a good sport, he joined us last hour. You, you couldn't script it. No. Bruce Smith is like the low-key, not wild, former NFL <laughs> player. Soft-spoken. And a really nice man. And you're just watching this unfold, and you're thinking, what is he thinking? And then you realize what he is thinking, and why is he thinking that when it comes to a toolbox? But uh, welcome to Hour 2. We'll check in with the uh, inside the NBA bubble. Joe Varden, who does a great job covering the association for the athletic, will join us and uh, get his thoughts on who he thinks is now the favorite. Are the Lakers still the favorites to win the NBA title? McLovin, did we come up with a poll question in the first hour? We did not. We got sidetracked okay. by a tool discussion. All right. Uh, well, then hit me with the possibilities here. Okay. Uh, you guys did not want to go with my tool question. We were, we were having a debate over here about best defensive player. So I had a poll, but Paulie wants to redo that. I gave my top five defensive players. So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, on the NBA, uh, do you think they start on time, yes or no, based on the early test, two in Orlando? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. I, I'm going to be cautiously optimistic and say yes, it starts on time. I, I'm curious about James Harden and when he gets to Orlando, because, you know, I do like the Rockets as a dark horse here, but... Russell Westbrook has already tested positive and by all accounts, pretty successful that I think they had two tests inside the bubble test positive, uh, I should say, uh, over 300 tests. So uh, we'll talk to Joe Varden about that. But the safety precautions that are put in play, uh, I feel a whole lot better about that season than any other season that might take place this summer. What else, McLevin? Okay, uh, tomorrow is Dak Prescott Day, uh, last day to sign mm. him. Uh, I'm going to give you an offer. You can sign one of these three quarterbacks to a five-year, $200 million deal, which is right around where Dak will probably rumored to be. You get Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, or Carson Wentz. Who is the guy that you would sign first? Knowing all things about health included, everything about them. Well, Wentz already got his deal. Right. I would probably go to Sean Watson, but my concern is he doesn't have anywhere near the talent around him. I'm not confident with his head coach, slash GM. I feel a little better with Dak Prescott in the hands of Mike McCarthy, and they've spent money on an offense. I'd probably do Dak Prescott because it, it feels like they have everything in place right now. Offensive line, running back, they spent money on their wide receiver. So as a quarterback, I have everything that I need to be successful. Carson Wentz does not have that, and Deshaun Watson does not have that. I think those are those quarterbacks are probably better if there was an open market, an open draft. Wentz and Watson would go before Dak Prescott. But 
I, I'm taking Dak Prescott because of everything I get with Dallas. Yes, McLovin. I think that's such a good point because when the Eagles, everyone's injured on the Eagles, Carson has to run around to make plays. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want him doing too and, much. And Deshaun Watson is the same way. When they press, he makes plays on his own and he gets risks. Yeah, Paul. Watson, uh, led, he was sacked more than any other quarterback in 2018, 62 times. That dropped to 44 times last year. It seems to be going in the right direction. And his passing... He's a 67% passer, 4,000 yards, 26 touchdowns, 12 picks. He runs a little, but not a lot. I mean, he's not uh, you know, the leading rusher in the league. But his sacks are down. He's being sacked. Yeah, he didn't have great weapons, though. No. That's my problem. And they traded their best one. Yeah. And I, I just... Bill O'Brien is a play caller and offensive-minded guy, but you don't have an offensive-minded team. Yeah, McLovin. But if you pay Dak all that money, then are you going to be able to keep these weapons around him? Is it in a catch-22? Well, you've paid everybody. Dak's the last guy. Amari Cooper got paid before Dak did. And Zeke Elliott, we know, got paid. Offensive linemen have gotten paid. It's now Dak Prescott. And, and that's the final piece. If this team is going to win a Super Bowl... Now, do I want to give him five years? No. He wants four years. The Cowboys want him for five. But I don't know if they're doing that because of, you know, what that salary is going to look like, how they spread that out, you know, whatever against the cap and all of those things. But it feels like both sides know exactly where the breaking point is. That's usually what happens in a negotiation. Like, you know, now they haven't spoken, I believe, negotiated since March. That would be a little more nerve-wracking, I think, concerning. Because let's say he doesn't get a four-year deal or they don't get a five-year deal. Now you franchise him, and which is what I would have done in the beginning. I would franchise him and then franchise him again. I still get the feeling that Dallas is not quite sure that what they have with Dak. I just get that feeling. And do you want to pay him that money? Is he truly one of these great quarterbacks? But what happens is we go... Can you believe what Kirk Cousins got? And then you move on to the next guy. And then do you believe Jared Goff and what he... And then you move on from that guy. And then Russell Wilson... And then you move on from him. And we'll move on from Dak Prescott. Not as fast because people love clickbait and they love to talk about Dak Prescott. Is he worth that money? Uh, did they make a mistake in not signing him to a five-year deal? Why did they give him four years? Did Dak make a mistake signing four not... Five? I mean, this is what's going to happen. But... Dak Prescott, by all accounts, even if they franchise him, is going to be well compensated. Yeah, Paul. There's no middle ground at the quarterback position. You either pay him full boat or you move on. There is there's really zero middle ground. Guys like Mike Glennon will get a year for fifteen million, or Case Keenum will get two years for twenty million. That's kind of the where you are if you're a career journeyman backup or your max deal guy. And Dak, Dak Prescott, he's twenty six, five thousand yards and thirty touchdowns last year. He's definitely not even close to, you know, like Jameis Winston, where he's more of a detriment than a help. He's the opposite. I just don't know. This goes back to, and I never understood this, and they've since changed it. The number one pick in the draft was going to get $50 million. Remember Sam Bradford and Jamarcus Russell? And you're going, wait, you're the highest paid quarterback in the league day one, and I don't know if you can play. And it just seemed backwards. Now, they finally changed it where they go, oh, yeah, they should probably come in and prove themselves. This is another situation. Every quarterback who steps up is not better than the previous quarterback who stepped up and got paid. Like, at some point, you have to have financial sanity where you go, you know, I know he's supposed to make a dollar more than Russell Wilson, but uh, you know what? Your quarterback's not better than Russell Wilson. Sorry. We're going to pay you this. When's the last time a quarterback and I'm going to say well-known quarterback, got paid less than somebody. Because it feels like like Aaron Rodgers is a bargain. What's Aaron Rodgers make, it feels like? I don't know. I mean, he's going to get paid a whole lot if, if he's still on the, uh, the team, but you, you start to look at these quarterbacks and you go, Drew Brees, $25 million. That's a bargain. But it feels like that next quarterback, well, he's got to make more than that guy. Well, we know that's not going to happen with Patrick Mahomes. Nobody's making more than him. But Deshaun Watson 
it's, he's going to make more than Dak Prescott, right? Yeah, Paul. Aaron Rodgers signed before the 2018 season. In 2019, he's going to make a total of like $29 million. That, that's a bargain. Yeah. And the, his max deal in 2021 at age 37 will be $36 million. That's the most he can make. And that might be a bargain as well if he's still with the team. It feels like he'd still be with the team, but, but that'd be it after that. Yes, McLevin. I have another. It's a more specific poll question, but it's more of a philosophical one. Bear with me. Okay. Who would you pay Ooh. first? Two guys who are up tomorrow. Running back Derrick Henry of the Titans or defensive tackle Chris Jones of the Kansas City Chiefs. Two of your favorite guys. Mm. But you have to pay Chris Jones a lot more than Derrick Henry. That's a fact. Am I going to have to pay twice as much for Chris Jones as I am Derrick Henry? Ooh, I don't know. It, it'll be at least three quarters. Yeah, it'll be significantly more. Like, which is a bigger priority, the superstar defensive tackle or, the, or what Derrick Henry means to the So Derrick Henry is going to be $15 million. Right. That's like the but he's already pay. been franchised, hasn't he? Right. They have, both those guys are franchised. Okay. And, they have, so, and they're working on the deal. They're, they could, could be signed by tomorrow. If not, then they go into the season with franchise tags. And Chris Jones may not report at all if he doesn't get Yeah, signed. I saw that. I'm going to take Derrick Henry. And I believe both players are the same age. They're both 26. I'm going to take Derrick Henry. I don't like signing up a running back for that second deal, but... You know what? If I could get Derrick Henry for three years, then I would give him I'd give him sixteen, seventeen million. I'd give him a little bit extra because Derrick Henry puts you on the cusp of going to the Super Bowl. And Chris Jones helped you win a Super Bowl, but Derrick Henry almost single handedly got you to, you know, the precipice of playing in the Super Bowl. So I'd I'd say Derrick Henry. Cost me a little less, but I, I don't want him for more than three years because of that style. I If I got him for three and he and he's done at 29, then I've gotten my money's worth out of Derrick Henry. Chris Jones is a good player, but it feels like Chris Jones might not be happy no matter what happens here. And that's an issue that you're going to have to deal with as well. Yeah, McLeod. Did you once say, though, that the Chiefs would not have won the Super Bowl without Chris Jones? I remember yeah. you said something like yes. one specific game. Yeah. Was it the Super Bowl game yeah. or one of the playoff games? No, both? it was the Super Bowl where he knocked down those passes, and if those are completed, then the Niners are going to win the Super Bowl. He he stepped up and had a couple of big moments there, and that's a defense that's not great. But as you know, I am a echo chamber here when I talk about at some point during the season, somebody on your defense will have to make a big play for you to win a Super Bowl. It happens. Down through history. You can have the greatest offense. You can have all the weapons. Somebody has to make a play on defense. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, when the, the Patriots lost to the Eagles, they had all the offense you'd ever need. Brady, they didn't punt. 500 yards passing. No one made a play. Malcolm Butler makes a play. With all that offense the Patriots had, Malcolm Butler makes a play to win the Super Bowl. Steelers, all that great offensive weapons. James Harrison makes the interception on Kurt Warner and takes it back at the end of the first half. Chris Jones, Kansas City, the best offense in football. One of the best we've ever seen. If Chris Jones doesn't knock down those passes, they don't win the Super Bowl. Yeah, Paul. Chris Jones in the Super Bowl, the defensive tackle. His stat line was no tackles. One assisted tackle, <laughs> no sacks, no quarterback hits, but he had three batted down balls in the last five minutes of the game, and yeah. they are all on crucial plays. Yeah, crucial plays. Yeah. I mean, he easily could have had MVP, almost like Santonio San Holmes grabbed it late. By the way, have you seen the Cam Newton hype video? Because I'm in, I'm ready to go, my Patriots. And uh, I don't. Do we have the audio of this? Can we uh, play this? This it, It's like a black... It looks like it's a movie, but it's shot in black and white. It looks like it's early morning, and he's working out. And yes, uh, Todd. Does Jared Stidham now feel like he needs to answer <laughs> that with his own hype video? Because now it looks like Cam's definitely the week one starter after watching that. All right. Uh, this is a portion of Cam Newton's hype video while working out. You know what, make this... 
different is they ain't never seen this cam. They ain't never seen them. Shit, you wanna know how I know? Shit, they ain't never seen them. The forgotten cam, though. The shit on cam, though. Tired of being sick of tired cam. Felt like I was just left to die. You know what I'm saying? Just, 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 just. It's over with for him. He ain't the same player. Mm -hmm. You know what make this different? Is they ain't never seen this cam. All right. So aside from, you know, Hawkinson loogies there. That's kind of gross. Yeah, it was. A morning workout there. I'm ready. Wait, oh, Cam went third person. Because they ain't never seen Early. this Cam. Yeah, and I went, oh, okay. How do you know that, Whoa. Cam? Because I've never <laughs> seen this Cam. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> Man, the Patriots just got interesting. I love that he goes, uh, the sick and tired of being sick and tired, Cam. <laughs> like, yes, dude. <laughs> yes. Oh, the Patriots are interesting. I love that Cam. They got some personality. That would be great if Jared Stidham came out with one. Jarrett's ready to complete a third and eight. Yeah. <laughs> Jarrett is ready to work hard and be the first in the locker room. They've never seen this Jarrett either. <laughs> or they've never they've never seen this did him. The new one. Wait, was new. that was that your your Jarrett <laughs> voice there? Yeah. He's gonna do a hype video. That they've, was the, the white guy. They've never right actually with... seen this version of me <laughs> either. Because <laughs> he can't get away with going third person. They've never seen this Jarrett before. Jarrett's ready for his opportunity to shine yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, what I'd like to do is just see the MRI of your shoulder and your foot, and then I, I'll be good. But that, those would be the things. I don't need to see the hype video. I enjoyed it. But I'd rather see the MRI of your shoulder and your foot. They've never seen this rotator cuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I probably have. That's what I would want to see. Man, I hope that he's back. Uh, uh, 2015, even uh, even just like a reasonable facsimile of 2015, Cam. Would anyone in this room bet that Jarrett Stidham makes more starts for the Patriots, more starts than Cam Newton? Yes, McLovin. Yeah, I like I'm a Stidham guy, old school. Just because uh, all those reporters are saying that the Patriots wanted to give him the job, and he's good. Well, they got Cam at a price they couldn't pass up on. Yeah. And I think that's the key, that there's very little financial risk here. And the reward could be, you know, very, very high ceiling here. I am curious about how Stidham processes this, where he's like, no, no, bring on the competition. Can't have too many Auburn quarterbacks in camp. Or do you go, as soon as he stands side by side with Cam, and all of a sudden he's going, oh, my God. What am I doing? That's the problem with being on the same team with Cam. Well, no, it's not look... a model, but I'm talking about when he's out there working out. Yeah, he's going to look small. All of a sudden, he's seen you know, Cam being Cam, if that's the case. Yes, Todd? T-shirt, Jacked and Jill. Is that a little too mean-spirited for Stidham? What was it? Putting the two quarterbacks together, Jacked and Jill. Cam Newton being the Jacked muscular one. Going to... Take a break. You had a good Monday, I, I will did. say. You had a I damn just, good I just Monday. Just it all. Just and, and Bruce Smith was a good booking, but man, this is a whole new hour. And it all went to the wayside. Only as good as your last performance. Jacked and Jill. And you know what? I could see you working on it. I was. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the problem. You could hear the creaking of the, uh, can't the brain you, cells. Can't you workshop these things? And you don't always have to verbalize everything that pops you don't, your head either. You don't, but you do. I do. You do. We're going to take a break. We're going to uh, venture into the NBA bubble coming up. Joe Varden, who covers the NBA for The Athletic. Are the Lakers still the team to beat? And if not, who is? It's approaching 20 after the hour. Glad you're part of the program. Dan and the Dan, that's Dan Patrick Show. Yeah. 
He's uh, Harold Reynolds, Major League Baseball Network analyst, former Gold Glove winner, three-time Gold Glove winner? Uh, yes, yes, three times. How right. about that? I know, I know. Uh, three-time Gold Glove I winner. I know, you're, you're thinking you only had one of them. You probably wanted all three of my <laughs> Gold Gloves at the station there. I know McLovin tried to hang on to it forever. But you know what's weird, though? You know, you loaned us your gold glove, and it was great to have. And what people have to understand is it's actually just a baseball mitt that is spray-painted gold. Like, it's it, – it, <laughs> Yes. I mean, it's cool, <laughs> but it's it's kind of a cheap, you know, award. I mean, it's a great honor, Harold. Don't get me wrong. I think the actual <laughs> it's a trophy they, they, they give you is just a glove, and then they get, you know, rust-oleum, and then they spray-paint it. Well, last night, um, <laughs> the Roberto Clemente Award was, was awarded to Yadi or Molina, right? So I'm down the field and I see the Roberto Clemente Award. It looks like the Heisman Trophy. Well, I won it back in 91. They gave me a ball that was basically the silver bronze disc, <laughs> like the gold glove. And I'm like, come on, man. i got to get a Heisman. He won three gold gloves. Yeah, for two. No offense or anything, but it's kind of a cheap award. It is. Like okay. I know, I know what you meant. If looking, you described it. looking, it the gold glove looked like a cheap award. Yes, yeah, it's an amazing honor to get. But <laughs> when we all got it, we were like, "This is what they give them." Really? Didn't, didn't you think it was actual gold glove? Like yeah, it, like it was a gold glove. Yeah, like when you tap on it, it would yes. be solid. Yeah, it was a rust oleum, high end rust oleum. Yes, because you could get a glove, and I could spray paint it. And I could spray spray paint two baseballs. I I think that we could probably construct a gold glove. It was a little more. It had the feel of like a more high end sixth grade art project. Okay. It was a little bit more art art project <laughs> that like you, somebody did that out in the garage and like look I made you this award <laughs> Skippy. <laughs> Congratulations, Skippy. No offense. Yes, Paul. I feel bad for Harold. He won the Roberto Clemente Award, which used to be just like this ball. Now it is. It's it's probably bigger than the Heisman Trophy, and it's very similar to I've got it on my screen. It's gigantic and gorgeous. In the past five years, <laughs> five to seven years, that's what they awarded. She could he he should get one. He's still an award winner. Yeah. But yeah, I remember when we got the gold glove and Harold had three of them and he and he loaned it to us for, I don't know, a year. And then he said, Hey, I want my gold glove back. It's like when Darius Rucker gave me the Grammy, and then the the folks from the Grammys saw it on my desk, and they're like, "Whose Grammy is that on Dan Patrick's desk?" And then uh, somebody said, "Oh, that's uh, Darius Rucker, Hootie and the Blowfish," and so they got a hold of Darius and said, "You better get that Grammy back." And I'm thinking, why can't I put it on display? Isn't it isn't it Darius's Grammy? Like it's somehow devalued that it's on Dan Patrick's show. Why well, can't we put it on? Well, well, it, it's. So, so we had to overnight that. Darius goes, got to send me the Grammy back. I said, nope, not happen. I, like, I don't know what's happened here. Got to send me the Grammy back. Yeah, not happening. No, I mean, serious, serious. You got to send it back. <laughs> He's getting in trouble. Yeah. And I, I'm going, you're never serious. He, no, you got to send the Grammy back. I said, okay. He goes, you know, they, the Grammy. I think he thinks or thought that he might not win another Grammy because they're going to hold it against him. Like the boss of the uh, recording academy was yeah. calling him up. Yeah. He's gonna... And then I, you know, I'm telling two a days, I go, you got to send that. It's got to be there tomorrow. You got to make sure. Oh, uh, how much do I insure it for? I go, I, I, I have no, a million dollars. I don't know. I don't know what it's worth. It could cost Darius Rucker his career. But, but, you know, that was, that at least had some, uh, I don't know, no depth, girth, something. It had some feel to it. The, the Grammy had some, some weight. Heft. heft. That's, That's it. And it's not big, but it's solid. I, I, I went girth you instead went girth. of heft. My bad. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. I just love, my, <laughs> let me just, I just love, by the way, while you're talking to Harold and uh, not intending to crap on his three gold gloves, you're like, hey, it's not a you know, great accomplishment. It's just, it's really looks we, like. We cheap- all thought the same thing when we saw that gold glove, right? We did. I you know, just never I, thought we were going to say it actually to that's Harold. That's true. Well, I'm live. Well, it's not Harold's it's fault. It's the, you know, Rawlings or baseball that they have this cheap award. It had a child's paper mache project feel to it. Yeah. With some nice spray paint. Yeah, it did.
This program brought to you by Mercedes AMG. Be prepared for whatever comes your way. It's the all new GT four door coupe because life is a race. Visit your local dealership for a test drive today. If you missed any of our interviews this week or any week from the Mercedes AMG man cave, go to danpatrick.com. Watch and listen from inside the Mercedes AMG man cave, Mercedes AMG driving performance. And if you missed our interview with Bruce Smith, Fresh off his celebrity family feud display, he uh, joined us last hour. You can go to danpatrick.com to uh, watch and listen to that. 877-3DP-SHOW, email address dp at danpatrick.com. Twitter handle at DP Show. He's the senior NBA writer covering the NBA and the Lakers for The Athletic. It's good to have Joe Varden back on the program. Joe, where are you right now? Uh, Coronado Springs in Lake Buena <laughs> Vista, Florida. Okay, now how much access freedom do you have to come and go inside the hotel? So what I've been doing is when I get a knock on my door for my food, um, I open the door very slowly and I stand on both sides of the, uh, of the door for several seconds to milk as much fresh air as I can out of picking up my food. Because um, that's it. The only time you can open your door is to pick up your food uh, or to uh, step outside for just a second to get the COVID test. That's the only freedom I have for the, until Monday. Can you visit other members of the media? No. You can't walk down the hall? No. And first of all, uh, you know, with, with most of the Disney hotels, it's not, um, they aren't Marriott's, so it's more of a motel feel. Like the, the hall, there is no hallway. It's just outside. Okay. Um, but yeah, can't, yeah, you can't do anything. But how long does this go for? Um, as long as I continue to test negative uh, for, for the virus, I will be allowed out of quarantine on Monday. So it's a, it's a seven or eight day quarantine. Any yard time? This feels like Shawshank Redemption. Can you hit the weights? <laughs> no. And, and um, I, I just finished uh, my second workout in quarantine, which is I do a uh, hundred pushups, sit ups, squats, crunches, uh, dips and burpees. And then I run from, let's see if I could do this on my camera here. Right. I run from that sink <laughs> to that door and back, uh, for 20 minutes. It was a little over two miles. So that's, uh, that's my yard time, my man. And then I, uh, I wipe the sweat up off the floor and try to clean up and turn this into a workspace. I did shower. I did shower before coming on. How confident are you? This is, we'll start on time and that will actually crown a champion. Um, a hundred percent on the start time. Okay. I, I think we're great. And I, I don't know. I mean, um, I still am in that stage where I feel like they've done this right and they've done this well, and it will probably work. Um, and, and I don't even want to say maybe, I mean, I, I really think that this is going to happen. Um, maybe it's in part because of all the protocols I have to go through. And I just feel like everybody here is doing it for the most part. And, um, the thing that feels the best is I feel like if, if you step out of line and do something dangerous, they're going to catch you uh, and you will be punished as, as we have seen already with these two guys who have uh, broken quarantine. And explain what they did to break quarantine. Like how, how does that happen that you're ordering food and it's being delivered? And did somebody rat out one of these players or both of these players? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, you know, what we, <laughs> With the case of, of Bruno, um, he was, I, I think he had a buddy uh, who was trying, who was going to drive him up something that he wanted, like something to wear um, while, while he was, while he was down here and just lost his mind. Like you, it's so unequivocally clear that, uh, that you cannot leave your room while you're in quarantine. Um, and then of the case with the case of Holmes, right? Like he went too far in picking up the food that that he had ordered. Um, you know, I mean, I guess you can call these mistakes, but they really they aren't. I think it's more of just um, not being used to having to follow a certain set of rules, and uh, and and you know, I, I think that reality is going to set in here. I like the Rockets as a dark horse here. We'll get into who you like and uh, are the Lakers still the favorites here? But Russell Westbrook testing positive. He's acknowledged that he tested positive. We're still waiting for uh, James Harden. Uh, yeah. But what, what, is there a reason why he's not there? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's because of, of the virus. Um, he just has chosen not to, 
uh, announce it and the, the teams can't do it okay. unless uh, they have the players uh, permission. So, you know, as of a couple of days ago, you had Mike D'Antoni saying, well, these three players aren't here and we can't say why. Uh, and then Russ kind of comes out yesterday and, and says that he has in fact had the virus. And the, just the time frame. So Westbrook is going to start on time. Uh, well, we don't know that. I mean, we, we, we don't know. Um, we, you have D'Antoni saying first earlier in the week, well, yeah, they'll, they'll all probably be here by midweek. And then last night it was, well, I hope that's what happens. I'm not sure. I mean, here's, here are the rules. Um, once you test positive, okay, you have to have, you have to have these things. You have to be asymptomatic. Um, you have to record two ne- consecutive negative tests over a period of longer than 24 hours. Um, you have to go through a complete medical screening. Uh, and, and then for, if you're a player, you have to uh, clear a heart screening because um, apparently there's some cardio related issues here. Um, so th- those are the rules. Um, w- when they got sick, we don't know. Or when they contracted the virus, we don't know. Um, typically, what doing everything I just said could take up to two weeks. So, you know, I don't know how long this is going to be for those guys. I, I think they will be back in time to start the season on, on July 30th, but don't know. We talked, we're talked. we talking to Joe Varden, uh, senior NBA writer covering the NBA and the Lakers for The Athletic. And speaking of the Lakers, with Avery Bradley not there, now Rajon Rondo out for at least six weeks, how big a deal is this for the Lakers? The, the, the um, Avery Bradley thing is huge. I, I really do. I think it weakens them. Um, it certainly affects them defensively on the perimeter. Um, and when you look at how deep the Clippers are and how healthy the Clippers are now, which they really had never been the whole season. Um, I think there is a lot to be concerned about, uh, on the Lakers, the, the Rondo issue. I mean, yeah, he was their backup point guard. Um, he was taking the ball, uh, when LeBron was, was on the bench and that, that certainly matters. Um, this had not been a good season for, for Rajon. Um, and certainly he had been discussed as, as a potentially weaker link in this Laker team uh, around the trade deadline. And ultimately they, they didn't make a move there really. So, um, you know, I don't know what the options are per se when with, with Rajan out, but, but of the, the two injuries, I, I definitely think it's Bradley. Who do you uh, favor coming out of the West? The Clippers, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, you know, Dan, I, I've spent most of my NBA career covering LeBron. Um, I, I don't like to bet against him, uh, certainly in, in 2018 in Cleveland was, um, <laughs> one of the most unsung acts of b- basketball heroism that'll probably ever go, uh, him getting that team that far. Um, but I just, I am bowled over by the Clippers situation right now. Healthy Paul George, healthy Kawhi Leonard, super deep with all the, uh, the moves that were made around the trade deadline, um. I, I don't know. I think they're the team to beat. But if but if the Lakers had Bradley and Rondo, would you feel different? No. Okay. Um, listen, I, I you know, I, I think the Lakers had a fantastic regular season. I really commend that such an uh, I mean, they're an old team with the new coach and Frank Vogel. Um, I, I really commend for how they went about their business and them catching the Bucks and being in first place at the time of the pandemic hitting is is awesome. But, you know, these NBA seasons are funny and and we actually often see that the best regular season team doesn't win, doesn't always that doesn't get to the finals or necessarily win it. Um, And in the case of the Clippers, they were always kind of doing this slow build um, and, and they probably more than any team benefit from, you know, this three and a half, four month layoff. The degree of difficulty, though, is. Like I can't. If you win the title this year, I get. There's no asterisk. The the whole season has an asterisk, but it feels like this, Joe. That those who don't like LeBron creeping up on Michael Jordan will add an asterisk to this. That this is different than anything that Michael accomplished. Like it's just weird. And and you've been around, you know, LeBron all you know for most of his career. It feels like people go out of their way to attach things to bring LeBron down a notch. Your thoughts if he does win a title with this team? Well, I, I just I would like someone uh, to explain to me uh, how the how these differing circumstances would then suggest 
that that a title doesn't count. I mean, you still have to win four four games and four playoff series. Um, the teams aren't any worse, <laughs> you know. Like they they everybody has their players at the start of this, and if somebody goes out with the virus, well, how is that actually different from them going down with an ACL or a you know an ankle? Um, when you talk about degrees of difficulty, I mean, I guess sure there you don't have to go. Um, into you know milwaukee's what is it five serve forum i think is the new arena there you don't have to go there in june and win but you know you also don't get to play at staples center and in the meantime everybody has the same you know crappy being away from your family being out of your own bed for three months without stop i mean i i just i i don't i don't get it from for this asterisk stuff um and if LeBron wins another one now, I mean, geez, that's what that's for um, on what three different teams. That's it's pretty good. <laughs> I also wonder about this, Joe, and you uh, made mention of this. This is an old team. And I wonder what will the Lakers look like next year? Because LeBron knows that the clock is ticking. You still have Anthony Davis and hopefully he stays. But, uh, you know, Kyle Kuzma, this is a Kyle Kuzma moment to step up and play big boy basketball as well. But what do you think this lineup, this roster looks like uh, next year with the Lakers? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think you're going to see turnover for sure. It's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to know how this pandemic affects free agency and affects teams, various cap situations and contract situations with options and whatnot. Um, I, I think that, that LeBron and Anthony are together for at least one more year you know, I, I've been thinking about this. It's funny, you know, that you asked it because I, I was thinking about this this morning on my run from the mirror to the door. Um, you know, LeBron was probably going to play a couple more years. Um, you know, he's 35 now. He'll be 36 in December. I, I think he would at least play out this contract with the Lakers. And I, and I suppose that's probably still true. But the added stress of the virus um, I just wonder if it's taking years off of his career. I mean, he's like I said, he's going to be 36. He's been through so much. And when it gets more and more dangerous to play this game, what else does he need to do? Um, how much time does he want to spend away from those boys uh, in the middle of all this? So, you know, I have not spoken to him since March, I guess. Um, and I haven't seen him. I, so I'm not saying I know that that this is cutting his career short, but I wonder, I mean, he's, He's got all these businesses. He's getting more involved politically. Um, I, you know, I, I, I could see this being something that weighs on a guy when you can start to consider how much longer you want to play. What's he chasing? Yeah, I mean, so after he won in Cleveland in 2016, he said, what, I'm chasing Michael's ghost, which meant he's chasing six. Uh, theoretically, he has time, but, uh, you know, he's probably not going to get there. And so, you know, his leg, his legacy was cemented when he won in Cleveland. I think that's true. Um, I don't think he can hurt it uh, by playing with the Lakers, especially because he did rebound from a bad start. Um, you know, I, I mean, if, if he is second best, does winning another one make him first best? <laughs> uh, no, he, I don't think so. But, but um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how much, I don't know what else he is chasing. It's just more about enjoying what you're doing in life. And you know what's going to happen. If Kawhi wins a title with the Clippers, so now he's won three titles with three different franchises, all of a sudden that will reduce what LeBron accomplished if he doesn't win a title with the Lakers. I, you know, I, I hadn't thought of it like that, Dan, but you're probably right. Um, it's just Kawhi like, I don't know how many titles Kawhi has to win to get into the discussion with LeBron. Um, and he's probably not going to get there because he's not a regular season performer. Uh, well, yeah. But, but you know, if he's winning titles, um, I don't know. He's a, I, it feels like, though, LeBron, we, we've said, oh, man, he's won titles with Cleveland and he won with Miami, and now if he wins with the Lakers. But if Kawhi beats him to the punch then I, it just feels like people say, yeah, so what? Kawhi did it before LeBron. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right. I think, but some of this has to do with um, your star power. When Just when you're talking about, when you get into these kinds of discussions and like Kawhi just isn't LeBron. He's like, he's, he's not 
Um, he, he's not the same personality, which I think matters. I mean, if you look at, you know, I, I mean, Michael certainly was that and LeBron certainly was that. And then behind him, you know, Kobe was that, I mean, I don't know what your order is, but I'm just saying that that matters. And uh, w- when you're, t- when you get into these barbershop discussions and Kawhi just doesn't have that personality, he never has. But I wonder, and I, I brought this up when we do those top 10 list or greatest mm-hmm. players of all time, who's moving in, in let's say the next five to seven years and who's moving out of the top 10 list, you know, cause Durant, Steph Curry, Kawhi, Greek Freak's not there yet to move into the top 10. But if if you see, like, Steph Curry's a top 10 player of all time, would you say? Durant, top 10 player of all time. And if that's the case, is Carl Malone moving out? Is Larry Bird moving out? Because somebody's got to move out if these guys are moving in. I mean, does uh, I, I think Durant's probably, probably already there. Um, Oh, as far as top five, I, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I get tripped up by this stuff, Dan. I, oh, I, I do I too. Know. I do too, I, Joe. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I mean, like I, I was thinking about this as you were talking, I was thinking about it from the Tiger Woods perspective. Um, he's on my mind because he's coming back to play this week in golf in uh, the city between our two hometowns. Uh, and, and, you know, we uh, like it when, when Rory came out, came onto the tour and Jordan Spieth, like, those two were, they were going to be the next tiger and neither one of them turned out to be the next tiger. And so like, we have a top five, I guess. And we have like, like LeBron absolutely took the mantle from, from Michael. He, he was the heir, uh, still is, um, who, who is the next one? I mean, there, there's going to be one, but it, we have seen throughout history that they don't come automatically right away. Like they, they aren't there immediately to take the reins. And so, Maybe it's Giannis, maybe it's Zion. Um, you know, Steph and, Steph and Kevin Durant are great, but they're older players. Like, neither one of them have a ton of time left. And, and Kevin Durant is coming off that injury that you don't know. Uh, how, like, it's the worst injury you can have in the NBA. So, I mean, how good is he going to be? I'm not sure. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know that, there, that, that there's much movement in the next five to seven years. Yeah, I feel like if one of those guys wins another title, especially if Steph moves, Steph might already be there because he's considered the best shooter of all time. And, uh, you know, so that, that, that carries a lot of cachet. If the NBA could give Zion a bye into the, <laughs> to, into the first round to face the Lakers, would they do that? If they could do that privately, that they could manipulate it and have Zion face the Lakers in the opening round. Listen, they, yeah, they, they have already, <laughs> yes, yes, they, they've already quasi done it. I mean, you know, they, they set up the, the whole NBA regular season TV schedule last summer for this season on Zion Williamson. I mean, yes, LeBron had something to do with it too. Yes, the Warriors had something to do with it too, but the whole thing was set up for him. And a week before the season starts, he has surgery on his knee or he announced that that's what's going to happen. I mean, that wrecked their whole thing, cost them millions of dollars in TV ratings. Yeah. It did. Yeah. And so now they set up this, uh, this post like this restart, basically with this totally unique set of rules. So Zion has a chance um, <laughs> to get back into the playoffs. I mean, yes, they would do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's great to talk to you. Be safe. I'm going to go outside and get some fresh air though, Joe. Is that that's fine? That's okay. And probably get a bite to eat or something like that. Yeah, go hang out with some. <laughs> Think friends. of me. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having that's, me. That's uh, Joe Varden. He covers the NBA for the athletic. Uh, we'll take a break back after this. Uh, most awkward talk show appearance that you've been on was what? Well, they're all a little awkward. I mean, they really are, aren't they? But I like them all in their own different ways. I really do. I'm not just being diplomatic there. But th- my th- most th- awkward. Yeah. You really want it. Yeah, I do. I don't have one off the top of my head. I um, The first time I went on Ellen... I think that I had... Did you dance? 
Oh, I don't remember. No, I you try had not to dance. Think about it. I think you do have to, but I don't. I think I move gently. I don't think I, <laughs> I want to make news. <laughs> but I do think that I had watched her for so many years as a performer, both on her show as a stand-up, and then on her talk show that I thought that I thought everybody would like me there more. And I that I that didn't go as fun as I thought it should. Does that make sense? So when you said something that you thought was funny and then you didn't get yeah, the and reaction? I don't remember specifically exactly. It, when, but it wasn't even that. It was more of a general feel. I thought this should this should be more fun. And and but and that being said, I've been on several times and I really really like her and uh, and it has been fun since then. But like. You know when everybody's like, oh, you should, everybody had always, you should work with, oh, you and Ellen will get along. And it was like, I mean, it was fine. <laughs> it wasn't, she didn't seem to go like, finally, where have you been all my life? Oh. You know. But there, you have to know that the host gets the loudest laughs. Like when you're on Letterman, you can't out funny Dave. No. And and even if you're not trying to, the audience will let you know that you're not as funny as Well, they're not there Dave. to see you. Nobody lined up their tickets to see Dave. Well, nobody's lining up tickets to see Dave anymore, right? But because uh, he's not working, not because he's unpopular. Yeah. Um, but uh, but they, nobody, you don't know who the guests are going to be when you get your tickets. Yeah. So. Well, we're glad to have you. And hopefully well, this I'm, isn't going to really be awkward. I'm thrilled here. to be here. Gentlemen, it is National French Fry Day. I think everyone likes French fries, yeah. especially when they're French a kid. Fries. Maybe not so much anymore, but you know. I was going to give you a Maybe choice more. of four options, or you can go rogue on Off your the own. Board. The classic French fry of salt and vinegar, which most people don't even try anymore, but it's still very good, by the yep. way. Um, ketchup, fine. Standard. Now, I'm going to give you two options here. Cheese fries, mm. just cheese, mm. or chili fries, which Ooh. I prefer. So you could have, this is your only choice for the wow. rest of eternity. Oh, eternity. Ooh, all yes. of eternity, oh, not just the day. Yeah, yeah not, oh yeah, no. Ketchup, salt and vinegar, cheese fries, chili fries, other. Todd, I'm going to start with you because this seems like your meal you. Um, from what you had there, I was going to go with those cheese fries because I like those thick steak fries, but I'm going to go off the board and go Nathan's French fries. That's my all-time favorite. It's not fry. the brand, it's the topping, Todd. It has to be a topping related? Yeah, it was not. I thought I just any type of French fry. No, we had fry. ketchup, and then you had vinegar. I'm going right? to I'm gonna do this again because okay. it was very... Chili and yeah, cheese. The first one seemed kind of plain, but I guess a little vinegar on it. French cod versus waffle fries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you could crinkle cut. That's, that's yeah. tomorrow's yeah. morning <laughs> meeting. Gonna, I'll Which go I with, thought you might do. This is the uh, accoutrement. Okay, I was so excited by saying Nathan's French fries. I'm going to go with the steak fries with the cheese on it. I like that. God, that's mine steak, right there. Healthy. Andrew. Well, this might take over, but... There's two kinds. They like when I was a young man in Montreal, they at McDonald's they served with gravy. Uh, what's it called? It has poutine, a, like poutine. Poutine, amazing. But there's something else I like to put on fries. Mayonnaise. No. Oh. 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 Very Amsterdam of you. Oh, fries are European. Oh. Very oh. Oh. Did you have a beret on when you? The uh, Netherlands. <laughs> so. Mayonnaise. The fact that I put mayo on burger was scandalous. I mean, it was like the third oh. trending story in America. I'm afraid where this might go, but yeah, I'll dip. I'll dip those fries in mayo. But like, you'll <laughs> ask for it on the side at a restaurant if 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 you. Yeah. Well, like if you're at um, Shake Shack, they have mayo there, so oh. you just like God. use your hamburger accoutrement. Do you uh, guys... I'm going chili. No chili. You're, you're going chili. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, I got to bring it back to mainstream. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. the vinegar sort of brings me back to the Jersey Shore, so I might, uh, Ooh, well, thanks. I haven't had that in a long time. Something about that sounds really good right now, but for all of eternity, I might get sick of it. I'm going to stick with the vinegar. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to stick with it. This mayonnaise uh, bombshell. Oh, take over. I can't even focus anymore. I, I knew. I, I was going to tell you to go to me last, Paul, because I knew. Yeah. It ruined uh, my morning.
I did not know this, but it's National French Fry Day. And Paulie said, if you could put toppings on French fries, chili, cheese, vinegar, and salt, and what Ketchup, of course. Oh, ketchup, of course. Or if you have an alternative that you like. Some people like other. Yeah, and McLovin went with mayonnaise. Yep. Yeah. This is a week after my mayonnaise hamburger thing, or two weeks after. Yeah, I don't get mayonnaise. So you don't like mayonnaise on anything? No. Not a club sandwich even? No. No. You're not alone. I'd say 35% of people do not put mayo on anything. Yeah, I just don't get mayonnaise. I I don't know. It's not any real taste for me there. If you're going to add a condiment, I like something that's got a little spice to it. You know, something's got a little personality there, like, uh, you know, spicy mustard or something like that. Yeah, Paul. If you remember the movie Pulp Fiction, uh, John Travolta's character talks about being in Amsterdam and dipping French fries in mayo. When I went to Amsterdam years ago, and people were walking around like street fairs with like a cone of French fries with a little sidecar, which was great. But they gave you like, I think it was curry ketchup or curry mayo. And I tried to embrace the locals, and mm. it was like curry mayo. And I, I had it once, and it was fine once. I yeah, see. But that's kind of like... To me, the the sign of something not being good is when you have to change it to make it good. It's like mayonnaise is okay, yeah, but if you put in a little curry in it, it's really good. You're like, oh yeah, okay, now I'm into it. If it's just mayo, like, yeah, no, that's all right. McLovin, would you care to respond? Well, I think the reason people love mayo is it adds fat to the uh, any dish. It's just like you know, it's like basically mm. fat. So that's why it's such a popular condiment. Wait, they like it for the gratification of its fat. Yeah, like you like eating things with fat. It's like appealing to like, yeah, you're basically adding a, like butter. It's like adding butter to something. You're adding a lot of richness. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, most, but it's funny. Most people are not neutral about mayonnaise. They either hate it or they love it. You would seem bland. Like I just it. have no use for it. Yeah, see. Like, I think it works really well on some things, but then on others, I just can't do it. Like, uh, like if I had a BLT right now, a little mm. mayo on there, that'd be, mm. that'd be real good. By the way, I get this text last night from Todd. And uh, he says, I don't know if I can wait until Wednesday for our pizza day, which we were going to test the pizzas, get four pizzas out of New Haven and a blind taste test, which I had while I was on vacation. And it came to my mind and Paulie's, but Paulie uh, text first, say, are you paying for it? So Todd- Or producing it. Are you you going to be part of this or are you just going to sit here and have somebody feed you? I get, I could pick up the bill if, if that's uh, if that makes everybody happy. I don't have a problem with that. Well, Polly can be the producer and you can pick up the check. Then we can do that. All right. That's how things get done around here. Unless you wait for me to get them done. No, then, you shouldn't always have to uh, thanks, Todd. orchestrate everything. Thank you. Yes, Paul. I have an alternative, Todd. I'll buy... And then you, during the show, can go out and get no, the pizza. <laughs> your wow. pick. Your pick. We know that's not happening. Wow. It's his choice, though. Yeah, yeah. I get this text, and it's like, I don't know if I can wait until Wednesday for our pizza slam. I got really excited yesterday with all that pizza talk. <laughs> I, and I, we can do it tomorrow if you want to. And we can order it during the show, and then I could have uh, one of the backroom guys go and get it. We could have it just in time for lunch. We are definitely due for a pizza party. Yes. One of my favorite memories of the show after the show, one day... Seaton orders his own pizza. Real oh, nice. Oh, no. A, a real thin pizza. It's not a big pizza. <laughs> and it was a, like a medium. It was not big. Oh. And he put it kind of on the area that's to the left of Seaton's desk, but it's Seaton's desk still. And all and uh, Prissy goes, ooh, and, and does his hands like this, goes up, takes a piece, and just wolfs it down. And so he goes, no, go ahead. Go ahead and have a piece. For whatever reason, I thought there was a pizza party going on, and that was just one of several pizzas being brought out. I believe I Todd's direct quote was, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I said, he took a, he grabbed a slice and took a bite. I said, ah, that's all right, Todd. Go ahead and just eat my lunch. It's fine. That's all right. <laughs> You're bad. an original, man. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, left, I left him over a couple of slices. And I don't have to pay for anything. Perfect. One hour left to go here. Dan and the Dan and Dan Patrick Show. We got a, a picture of you. Uh, that is the small Afro yeah, suit. That was uh, cut down. What what year is that? That was 1977, rookie year in Pittsburgh. Wow. You can see the number 17. They didn't think I was going to make the team. 
No, that's a solid number, though. 17? Not for a DB. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It, was a, it would have been a nice number for a quarterback, but unfortunately, <laughs> oh. they didn't have me playing uh, quarterback then. Did, did Bradshaw know you by name? After he did, actually. After this, because here's what happened we're playing in Houston. Bump Phillips is the quarterback, I mean, the coach of the Oilers. Robert Brazil and Elvin Bethea are knocking people out <laughs> left and right. Bradshaw gets hurt, breaks his wrist. Mike Kruzak separates his shoulder. We have nobody else to play quarterback. Except for? I go in, play the fourth <laughs> quarter, and Terry Bradshaw says, who is that that just went in to play quarterback? From then on, he knew who I was. That's the biggest Afro uh, that we could find on you. Yeah. I Did had, you destroy all the other ones? Uh, well, the college pictures, yeah. I, I had more hair in college. I, I said I got to go conservative when I get to the NFL and cut it down a little do bit. Do you think you'd have dreads? You, you'd no, have extensions? No, I, I wouldn't you have You would extensions. not do that. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go, Tom. That, now, that's the high school <laughs> Afro. Gosh, yeah. Wow. What year and what school? That was 1972, Jackson Parkside High School. Gosh, you guys went way back. <laughs> I too. And that was the blowout kit. That's what you had there. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had to work to get that, that going. That's like yeah. shaft. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the era. That was it. Did you get the impressions in the, with the helmet? Yeah. The Rydell? Yeah, you did. You got the Rydell ropes going <laughs> through there. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that was, uh, shoot, that was probably 16, I guess. Wow. Yeah. What position were you playing then? Quarterback. Yeah. yeah. Quarterback. That is awesome. Board number eight, there was a guy named Jimmy Jones, played at USC. And uh, USC won the national championship, and he was a black quarterback, black quarterback at USC. Yeah. I was like, okay, I got to be number eight now. <laughs> oh, so you saw there was saw a black Jimmy quarterback? Jones, yep, like, yep, that's my guy. Really? Yep. Did uh, USC recruit you? Wayne Fonts came in that year, right after that season. He came in, he said, and you know, typical Wayne. Man, you look just like Jimmy Jones. <laughs> really? Yes. Yeah. Number You're eight. I saw. Yeah. Great. I saw the same mannerisms that we recruited Jimmy. You can do it. And then, uh, who told me I was? Well, you would know the name Gary Jeter from yeah. Cleveland. So we're taking Play trips together. Yep. And stuff. Oh, come on out to USC. And uh, somebody on a recruiting trip said, don't go to USC. The quarterback lives go. with the head coach. You'll never play out there. Pat, Pat was living with, <laughs> with the McKays at that time. Coach, thanks for coming. Wow. That's fine. I'll be like this. <laughs> nice one. Thanks, you guys went way back. Hey. I love your research department. <laughs> oh, the All the right. IT. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 All right. Next Monday should be good. Fantastic. That's good. Yes. Same game. Woo. Could you beat Tiger Woods in golf right now? I might have a shot. <laughs> I, mean, I beat him once a long time ago, but I might have a shot now. Wait, wait, wait. I beat wait. him once when I was like a 16. Wait, so he gave you – he gave, how many shots did he give you? Yeah, they gave me all my 16 shots. Okay. The first time I played St. Andrews, I, I actually played with Tiger when um, the Dunhill Cup yeah. was actually an international competition. <laughs> so the first day I played, I played with him. The second day I, I played with Daly. But the day I played with him, he said, follow me. I was a 16. I shot 78. He shot even par. Oh, I win. Wow. You can hold that above him forever. I do. Did you play, <laughs> did you play Jordan? Uh, I, I've, I've played with Mike and Chuck a few times. Well, you can beat Chuck. Yeah. Does Does Mike talk trash to you? Yes, he does. He and Amai <laughs> woke me up one morning and made me get up in London. And we went out and uh, played together. I beat those guys with some rental clubs that day. Wow. Look at you.
Buckle up, boys. Time to go to work. Dan Patrick. Hey there, welcome back. It's another day, another edition of the Dan Patrick Show. Is it more of an advantage if your players are testing positive now? I mean, you, you're not hoping for it, but there's a benefit to this. Bringing you the biggest guests and best interviews as Dan is joined by the four Danettes. Paulie, Seton, McLovin, and Fritzy. And not to be forgotten, amongst all this turmoil is the following statement from respected analyst Chris Mannix. How about a playoff prediction? Blazers, Sixers in the finals. <laughs> Whoa! Okay. Going to just hit that one more time to cement it into your memory. Blazers, Sixers in the finals. <laughs> Broadcasting from the Mercedes Man Cave. This is Dan Patrick. Final hour on this Tuesday, Dan and the Danettes, Dan Patrick Show. Seton's been holding off all morning long, teasing me. When is he going to tell me? What's his opinion? Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're... Whenever you're ready, bud. Hamilton, the musical. It's available on Disney Plus, I believe. McLovin has seen it. Well, we actually went to the play. Yeah, I saw it at the public, actually. Oh. I didn't, but that's like the big like honor. If you saw it before it made Broadway, made Broadway. then you're like, you're in. Yeah. But you you saw the original cast. Yes. Twice. Which I twice never I saw. Did. Twice. I did. never saw the original cast. Well, remember when I went to see, uh, what was the um, play that was eight hours long? Oh, yes. What the heck was uh, that? And it was for like, uh, there were people there that were playing it, like Great Gatsby or something like that. Yes, it was. And Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. and Tobey Maguire were there. And we're in a real small theater down in the village. And they read a book. They, they read the entire book. That was the play. And it was eight hours long. And you get there and then they have a dinner break. And then you come back. <laughs> now, DiCaprio left. Right before the dinner, like when the dinner break happened, he didn't come back. Toby McGuire came back. What? What were they? Were they reading The Great Gatsby? Is that? Yeah, it was called Gats. That's right. And and it was an eight hour play. And my wife said, "Oh, hey, this is going to be so different." Now, so different means that's trouble. Oh, it's so different. And as I go, opposed to great. Yeah. And I go, well, what are the reviews? Oh, the reviews are great. So so what do they do? Um, they they read The Great Gatsby. So, like, is there any bombs, any explosions, any sex? Like, is there anything? No, no. They just, they just like, read the, read the book. And I go, okay. And I signed up for it. And uh, eight hours later, that, was, that gave me a lot of street cred uh, with my wife. Like, I had, I had some, uh, some credits built up there after that. But I remember seeing DiCaprio there. And he had a Cuban cigar. And he wasn't smoking it, but he was holding on to it. And then Toby McGuire, and they were giggling through the whole thing. And then they, of course, were going to do their great Gatsby movie. Uh, I don't know. How did it end up for Gatsby in the end? Did he, did he make it this time? He did not. He did not. Yes, Todd. Was your wife forthcoming about the duration of this whole deal? She yeah. She spelled it out. There's going to be an eight-hour project. Yeah. But, you know, I, it was one of those where, and you, you learn, it's negotiations when you're married. You're like, okay, if, all right, I'll take a bullet out on this one. All right, yeah. I mean, it was eight hours, but but it was a it was a great performance, but it was still eight hours. All right, so a moment of truth here, Seton O'Connor. I've uh, asked you if you would take time to watch Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. So I watched it uh, last night, and I should probably say just up front that I don't. I've never been to a Broadway play. I don't go to musicals. I don't. So I'm not very well versed in any of this. Okay. Um, and so I'm probably not really educated enough on the medium to understand why Hamilton is so great. Uh oh. Um, because it's exactly what I thought it was going to be. And I think it, really I felt very validated about my impression of it. What did you think it was going to the be? The Constitution is the thing that we're talking about. His name is Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. All around the world again, going there and back again. Like, uh, this Whitley, is. Whitley, Washington. Yeah. I don't know. Need me to begin again, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. I, it's just not my thing. I'm, I'm sorry. It, oh, no. No. It's, it, you, you validated that you don't know anything about Broadway. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, and maybe I don't want to then. If that's, 
if and, that's the best there is, I don't want to go there. And that's good. There's that means more orchestra seating for me. Did your wife like it? Uh, no. Okay. No. How and about the, your son? Uh, he was furious at me that we wasted three hours. Uh, actually, to be fair, we did about. I only did about two hours. I got an hour in and realized there was still another two hours to go and fast forwarded to closer to the end to be like, well, this is probably where the good stuff is. Wow. It's just not my thing. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. No, I get it. It's not for everybody. Um, I'm definitely, there's not a lot of people, because uh, as soon as I like, I tweeted that we were watching it or stuff, like, it's going to change your life. <laughs> <gasps> oh, I'm so jealous you get to see it for the first time right now. Like all of this doesn't just... Maybe Not if it. you saw it in the theater, uh, when, if you saw it on Broadway. Maybe. There, but, that might be. But that, you know, maybe not. Maybe you would go, oh, my God. Yeah, and, you know, there's some, that, here. there's some that I could do. Like I said, I've never been to a musical in person. I've never done that kind of thing. So, And I think that just trying to be fair, like it, it might just not be my medium. Yeah. It might not be my, like, the thing that I enjoy. Your milieu. My milieu. Milieu, yeah. yes, Paul. See, now I have a question. Can you not like something but appreciate the creativity of it? So there's the people are super talented. There's no no doubt about that, especially uh, the guy who played Aaron Burr. Yeah. Is just remarkable. And some of the other characters, I thought, like, man, like this person. That's uh, uh, Leslie Odom. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. He's amazing. He's really, really great. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the female leads there that played his wife, like really, really talented. It's just not like there's something about like the movements and the way everything is sort of done that it's just like that's not it for me. Like that's, that's not it. That's okay. It. Yeah, but, but super but, talented. But you tried, and that's all I ask. I, I definitely. That's all I ask. You tried. Um, Paul, are you going to watch it? I, I think I will. I've seen Even the- after that review? Oh. I'm somewhere in between. I appreciate. I saw a, a rap history rap years ago. It was called. You remember the, the Comedy of Errors, Shakespeare, the Comedy of Errors. There was a group that did it in the late '90s in New York, and they did. It was called the Bombity of Errors, like the Bombity of Errors, and they did Shakespeare with rap. And I mm. saw it in person. It was fantastic. Mm. Now I think it was the experience that was good. I don't know if I'd watch it again, but I'll check out Hamilton. Okay. Todd, do I even bother to ask? I liked musicals and Broadway shows more when I was younger, when I was going to see like Annie and Grease and Peter Pan. But as I've gotten older and people are just talking and all of a sudden they break out in song, it becomes to me a little more corny in my older age. You would think maybe it would be the opposite, that you'd appreciate it more. But I think I enjoyed Broadway back in the uh, little kid days. Now it's like, I, I, don't, I don't see myself watching That's it. That's a long note. Yeah, I don't see myself tuning Look, into that. That's a, yeah, I'm the club. I find myself now wanting to go back and see the other great musicals in person. Because what I was, I got to admit, there was a point where I was like, ah, right, go to a musical is not super macho, you know. But now the kids like the musicals and the music's pretty, you know, it's iconic and famous. Like, I'd, I don't know, have you been to a lot of musicals? I know mm-hmm. you guys go to the theater once in a while. I went to Les Mis. Yeah, that's the music from Les Mis. The soundtrack's yeah, awesome for yeah. Les Mis. I've never seen it. But I'd never been to a Broadway show. And my wife, we were dating at the time, and we went to see Brighton Beach Memoirs. And, you know, Neil Simon was one of the brilliant people in how he could write dialogue. And Matthew Broderick was playing in the starring role. And I, we watched uh, all three. Uh, and I'm trying to think what they are. Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues, and then there was one other, but... I just thought Neil Simon had this unbelievable cadence in how to write a play, and you have the you know the actors being able to deliver. It. And uh, I was mesmerized by it. Like, and it's live in front of you. Like when you see a, a movie, it's different. You're watching somebody doing a play. It's like somebody is doing something athletically. That's the way I view it. Uh, you know, the Book of Mormon. It was. It's right there in front of you that they're doing this every single day or night. And that performance, and I, I, I'm moved by those things. When I see somebody do something live, it, it just it, uh, it alters something in me. Yeah, Paul. I, I saw a play years ago. It was in London, and it was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the movie with Jack Nicholson, and Christian Slater played the lead role for a couple weeks. Mm. And it was fantastic because Christian Slater, Jack Nicholson, that's not a big stretch, but he really nailed it. I saw uh, The Phantom of the Opera on my honeymoon. 33 years ago, original cast. And uh, I remember, I, it's no the, big deal. I know, original cast. 
And uh, I just remember we had we had the last two seats in the last row all the way in the corner. I couldn't stand up and we're in London and I I was it was unbelievable. And that's one of those where I went, I don't want to go to see Phantom of the Opera. My wife goes, you need to go see Phantom of the Opera. I go, OK, just got married. Honeymoon. Yes, dear. Got in there, banged my head on the ceiling because the the, the way the um, the theater house, the roof was, it was really uh, low in the very corners. And I banged my head and I'm like, God. And then all of a sudden, is it Michael Crawford? Was he the, uh, and Sarah Brightman, I think. It was pretty good. Pretty good stuff. All right. Um, let's see. I, I've been fascinated with uh, Cam Newton, his hype video. And uh, we played a little bit of that last hour. He was also on the big or bigger picture with OBJ, Todd Gurley, and Victor Cruz. Here's uh, Cam Newton talking about all the teams that passed on him this offseason. We have to talk about the elephant in the room. And it's like, you know you who you, you coming after. And I'm like, yeah, great. Yeah. What he was, what he is, is great. Needs no even talking about it. But one thing about it, though, you, <laughs> Coach McDaniels, you're able to, to call some stuff that you ain't never been able to call now. All right. You, you know, and I told, hey, you're getting a dog. You, get, I'm, and you, ain't, you ain't you getting one of these ticked off dogs, too, that's like, bro. And I'm looking at the schedule. I'm like, who we play? That team passed on me. Okay. That team <laughs> passed on me. They could have game and got me. They hollered at me. I even asked my agents, like, hey, yo, so what's up with – Nah, man, the agent act like he was like, well, we got to wait to it was just all type of, you know, issues. So I'm like, bro, you know what? I'm going I'm going to take this time with the COVID. I said, I'm going to commit to myself. So Cam Newton uh, talking about following Tom Brady and all the teams that passed on him. That's courtesy of the bigger picture. I like I like this cam. I want to I want to see what it looks like when it all rolls out. Get him in uniform, get him in action, and see how he plays. But uh, he, he's got a chip on his shoulder, and uh, I hope that's the only thing he's got on his shoulder is a chip because uh, I'd still like to know how healthy he's going to be. I think he's got a chip in his shoulder. <laughs> he's got chips in his shoulder. That's part of the problem. He should have them removed and put on top. <laughs> I've had those chips in my shoulder. They wouldn't let me keep them when they took them out. All the surgeries, I was like, can I have the um, cartilage? Can I have the meniscus? I, you know, you don't get to keep them. I should be able to keep them, but uh, I was told that there were some laws or something where – and then, you know, the doctor's like, well, why would you want to keep them? I go, they're mine. Like, how many people are able to show things that were inside them and put it on – it's content. I'd be able to put it on display here in the man cave. Like – uh, that's surgery in 04. Uh, that's surgery in 08. Uh, I, you know, it'd be like Dr. Frankenstein. It'd be jars all over the place of all the things that I've been through. Uh, there's my uh, rotator cuff over there. We could throw in like an intestine of Fritzies, you know, like a put one next to there. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Some other stuff from other guys. Yeah. Well, they took out some of my knee and then they put in a uh, replacement knee. So. When they put in a replacement knee, I, I saw a video once. Is it like a... A metal titanium buffer between the 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 two uh, bones. I think so. You don't know. I didn't, I, Paulie. I got to the point where I had so many surgeries on my knee. I just said, just just make sure I can walk. That's all. I didn't care. You didn't ask what I didn't what, care what properties you're putting in your body. I didn't care. I just said, all right, whatever. I I seriously, I went in to see my doctor, and I'd been having all this pain, and I said. He goes, well, you could always do a replacement. I go, when? He goes, well, I, I could do it by the end of the month. I go, all right, let's do it. And I go home, and I said, uh, I'm having my knee replaced. My wife goes, oh, okay, well, when? I go, um, at the end of the month. He goes, uh, you're kind of rushing into it a little bit, aren't you? And I go, not really. I've been dealing with this knee since I was, what, 14 or 15. And uh, went and... Did it, got the rehab, and uh, haven't looked back. By the way, if anybody ever thinks about doing a uh, replacement knee, do it. Like if, if you're at that stage, do it. I wouldn't do both. At the same time, people will do both knees, and I, I will say it's the most pain I ever felt in all my surgeries in my knee the first three weeks. But, but I'm saying do it. <laughs> 
But but it's you can get three weeks of pain and then not have any pain, or you can continue to have that chronic pain there. But uh, the three weeks of pain, that was bad stuff. Uh, some phone calls here, and then we'll take a break. Jason in North Carolina joins us on the program. Hi, Jason. What's on your mind today? Thanks, Dan. First time, long time. I'm 6'2", 215. Um, I wanted to bring the discussion back to Hamilton and oh. Seaton specifically. Okay. Um, uh, I, like Seaton, uh, am very uh, um, resistant to uh, Hamilton. I've not seen it, and I care not to. Oh. And I was wondering if Seaton has seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show, because that's kind of a more – uh, uh, acceptable, maybe young person uh, musical, and I couldn't stand it. Seaton, did you see it and did you like it? Yeah, I've seen that movie for sure. Uh, it's almost like a yeah, like a rite of passage kind of thing. That at a certain age, you're supposed to watch that, um, and it's all right. Uh, you know, they I like that. There's the idea of the whole experience around it that you can go see it at midnight and people will throw things at the at a certain time or whatever. I yep. think that's pretty cool. And I, I'm not really anti all musicals. I, I'm granted I didn't see them on Broadway, but I like Chicago the movie, and I liked you know there's some that I've seen that I was like, oh man, that was really good. You mm -hmm. know. Thank but, you, Jason. Um, yeah, Rocky Horror Picture Show, it's interactive, and, uh, you know, there's rock and roll involved in it, great characters involved mm -hmm. in it. You know, it's campy, you, you know, but you have to kind of gear up for that campiness. Yes, yeah, And I really like that it felt like, uh, like it was really pushing boundaries of what people were comfortable with, and I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, Nathan in Wisconsin joins us on the program. Good morning, Nathan. Hey, Nathan. Hello. Hey, Nathan. Hi. What can I do for you, Nathan? So I have a question for you. Okay. Do you think fans won 10 NFL games this season? Do I think what? Fans will attend NFL oh. games this season. Uh, well, thank you, Nathan. And, um... I don't think so. I I just not the start. I mean, how about we just get to games? That's I'd be happy with just games. But thank you for the phone call, Nathan. Yeah, I'd be happy for just games to be played. I don't need to have fans to enjoy these games. Now, do they add certainly to a college atmosphere? Absolutely, but um, it it's not a deal breaker for me. I just want games to be played where players feel safe, and you feel like it's repeatable, that this week will be the same as next week. That's my biggest concern, is college football, pro football, baseball, I don't know how repeatable all of this is going to be. The NBA, it's going to be Groundhog's Day for everybody there. Wake up, you're going to be doing this. Uh, certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. Uh, and that's the way it's going to be in that bubble. But I, I think the NBA, you know, this prototype, and it probably only works. You know, hockey's trying to do bubbles in a couple of different cities, and, and hopefully they're able to accomplish that. But, it, but it's hard to be able to do this because the players being outside with a lot of these sports, the NBA played inside, hockey played inside. Can you kind of cordon off everybody for their own safety? And it feels like once you get in that bubble – and the number of tests that you're going to have to go through. And it feels like the media might be tested more than the players. And we talked to Joe Varden, who covers the NBA for The Athletic. He's locked in his room. He's doing wind sprints from the bathroom to the front door. Can you call them wind sprints? <laughs> I don't know if those, those are A sprints and there's no wind. Yes, Eden. And he said that he did almost two miles. <laughs> He went back and forth that 30 feet for, for 20 minutes and went two miles. Can you imagine being the person <laughs> underneath him? <laughs> Stop it, Joe! All right, we'll take a break. More phone calls coming up. It's uh, 20 after the hour. We'll talk about the Washington Redskins, who are putting to bed. They're retiring the Redskins. We just don't know when they're going to uh, bring us their new nickname. Is that the fault of the Redskins? 20 after the hour. This is the Dan Patrick Show. Maverick Irons using artificial intelligence. Callaway's done it again. 
the uh, first irons designed by artificial intelligence. And they didn't do it just for one iron. Every loft, every iron, flash, face, cup, uniquely designed by artificial intelligence, completely maximizes distance. Played over the weekend, and while I was really good and really bad, I think I had eight or nine pars. And I won't tell you what I did on the other holes. But when you hit these shots correctly, because see, that's what amateurs, weekend warriors, we don't know what it feels like or sounds like because the pros do it differently. And when you hit these irons correctly, and they're very forgiving, all of a sudden you go, well, that was different. The Maverick irons, get a set of them. Go to CallawayGolf.com. Callaway, the number one irons in golf. They also have the Maverick driver, uh, Odyssey putter. You're going to love the chrome soft golf balls. Callaway has all of it under one roof. CallawayGolf.com. You and Mark Jackson? Yeah. Okay, right. so, Doc, you decide. Uh, just, like, one sentence when you, you say. Rigid. There you go. Rigid. We're we're good. Good. Rigid. We're good. Okay. We're good. Rigid. Go Is this a free throw? Or? It's a free throw. I don't know when the pressure free throw. like that. Okay. Rigid. Rigid. All right. There you go. A little mm-hmm. short arm that a little bit. A little yeah, nervous. yeah. See, yeah. that's nerves. I See, love I saw that. I mean, they call me Markel. Like, Look at this guy. Wow. That's a good free throw. See, I oh, caught yeah, it before you shot it. That was good. Like it. Okay, you Chris can see the form there, free throws. No, I just which look. tells you what you need to know. Koozie-ish. <laughs> I'm going to go with koozie. Koozie? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, uh, you don't need to see mine. I, I love your form. It's, 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 oh, yeah, come on. there you go. So these are the two best right here, yeah. form-wise. I think you guys have a good shootout. Where would I rank on your team, you think? Right now? Right now. We're a good free throw shooting team. <laughs> I haven't said that in a long time since I've been with the I think we're like in the eight, we're like one of the better free throw wow. shooting teams. Okay. So All right. It's nice. Okay. No, no it's- stress as a coach. <laughs> when guys are going to the free throw line this year, it's amazing. But when DeAndre used to shoot yeah, those free throws. Yeah, that was tough. That was tough. <laughs> How about your Mo but Bamba? But he's at 80 idea. right now. Okay, can you do this? Could Mo Bamba stand at the, like, be here and, and go like that at a free throw? You're not supposed to. Okay. Well, you can't touch the ball. No, but if, if I'm Mo Bamba and I got a 7-8 wingspan and I can just go like that, I don't touch you the can, ball. You can do it, yes. It, is, is it against the spirit of the free throw? There's no spirit in our game. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, you could do that. Uh, but it's further uh, away than you think. So Yeah, but uh, Obama's got a 7-8 wingspan. But if you're right there at the line, yeah. and I'm Mo Bamba, and I could just be like that. I don't think you know that. But you may see it. Put Jonathan Isaac on the other oh, side. We have Boba. Yeah, a face Boba. Guard. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, fa- he'll face guard some yeah. people. All right, so I got a couple things from last week, some things from this week. Uh, so I'm going to start off today with just got, getting some great reaction with the Bruce Smith interview. Um, but I, w- I wanted to ask Dan something about something specific. He's over there, though. Um, so last week we had, everybody knows the ongoing thing we have with Qualcomm, right? So, Dan, last week Qualcomm, you know, we had off last week. I'm right? not part of the segment. This wa- is your segment. <laughs> I, want, I want you to confirm or deny something yeah, for me. To bring in the big talent. I just want to. I just. I'm booking you here. I want you to confirm or you deny go one thing. Todd. <laughs> Todd together. Already Dan, so, brought in. <laughs> uh oh. So I lost him. All right. So last week Qualcomm said uh, they took the whole week off for their anniversary, right? Um, and I just wanted to confirm or deny whether or not we took the whole week off before Qualcomm for their anniversary. I think we did, but nonetheless, right? <laughs> Going forward. We Man, got really just dangling out there. Just left me hanging. <laughs> just left me uh, hanging. You, you told me that this was going to be a great segment. You didn't say I need you for this great segment. I wanted to ask. I you need something. you to make it a great segment. <laughs> and then, based off of uh, Todd's headline, Jack and Jill, Chadwick on Twitter gave us this: Jack and Jill. <laughs> What do you think, Todd? I like it. Jacked. That's perfect. And Jill. 
Jack and Jill. That probably we works a little bit better here than what you People hate before. Mario. They <laughs> right? hate him yeah. so much. People hate Mario. George Jack. Jack. Hounds of Benson has. There you go. And Jill. Jack and Jill. Dang, new right. That's all I got today. Okay. <laughs>
but you're you're still looking at that team and you're going, all right, who are they and what are they? And you know, the NFC East used to be so potent. You know, with the Giants, don't know who they are or what they are. Feels like the Giants have a better handle. Uh, Daniel Snyder feels like he's uh, on his way to being a good successor for Eli Manning. Saquon Barkley, yes, we can argue that they never should have taken him number two overall. But are they going to be? I don't know what they have in their coach. I have no idea. Uh, And this is where the Cowboys should be pouncing. And they haven't. And the Eagles were all banged up, and the Eagles somehow won that division last year. And there is no reason for that. If I said Dak Prescott's going to throw 30 touchdowns, 5,000 yards, and you're going to go 8-8. Eight and eight. Now, we can put a lot of blame on Jason Garrett. But I got to put some blame. Like, there's, there's room to go around with the blame there. But 8-8? Eight and eight? And your quarterback throws for 30 touchdowns, 5,000 yards? There's some issues. Yeah, McClellan. The Redskins also have that problem where if 35 guys are injured by week seven. Yeah. I remember Trent Williams sued the medical staff. Yeah. There's something wrong. Yeah, but I, why isn't Dallas formidable? Even if it, it feels like Dallas's offense... And stay with me here. Dallas's offense can be a very, very high elite offense, like a Kansas City Ravens offense that they have a great offensive line and they have good weapons, good running back, and Dak is a uh, good quarterback, bordering on maybe a very good or great quarterback here. And your defense just has to be good enough. We saw that with Kansas City. Just be good enough. At big moments. Why can't Dallas beat Kansas City? And I know Mahomes is you know different than Dak Prescott. But if I look at the supporting cast, Dallas has a pretty good team on offense. Now, you don't have Kelsey and you don't have Tyreek Hill. But you do have some pretty good complementary parts. And your offensive line is better than Kansas City's. And you got Zeke Elliott. But they're not even close. They they outscored the opposition by 100 points last year. And you went 8-8. Eight and eight. Yeah, McClub. Maybe they should be more like the Ravens and just run and defense teams because they also have these stars on defense. But I don't know. They have stars. They have, they have names on defense. I don't know if they're stars. I think you become a name because you're on Dallas. And then we assume you're a star because you play for Dallas. But Demarcus Lawrence, Leighton Van Der Esch, Jalen Smith, you're right. I don't know. They, they seem pretty awesome when you see the highlights. They're, they're amazing. It feels like they have more talent on their defense than Kansas City does. Yeah. Like marquee players. So what is it? And, and maybe it's Mike McCarthy. Maybe. But is he going to help Dak Prescott throw for what? 5,000 yards is a great season. 30 touchdowns. Is he going to throw for 35 touchdowns? Okay. Is that going to make a difference here? Giants aren't going to be where the Cowboys are, and the Eagles maybe are still considered a better team. They shouldn't be, but it, it feels like that. Yeah, McClellan. Coaching. You think it comes down to that? I well, What did Shane Irving always yell about the Cowboys? He said they needed to run the ball more, right? He was well, always like, slow the game down, run the ball more, I think. Well, I can't have that defense out there you know, when the Cowboys went 13-3, and three, it felt like they controlled the clock and then they had their defense out there, but not exposed. And some of these teams put their defenses out there, they get exposed. They, they can't, they're not a formidable uh, defense. So you need to limit the number of times they're on the field. That was a knock with Kansas City, so they scored too quickly. Whereas the Ravens, the Ravens would control the clock and that defense, when that defense got on the field, I mean, the Ravens were probably the best team in football last year. And, you know, they looked past Tennessee and they got they got burned there. But, you know, the Ravens, probably both sides of the ball, were the best team in football last year, in my opinion. But that doesn't mean you win, obviously. Yeah, Paul. The Cowboys outscored their opponents last season by 113 points and were 8-8. Eight and eight. The Packers outscored their opponents by a total of 63 points and were 13-3. and three. And you go back to these discussions about Dak Prescott and his contract. And I said at the time, if you're going to eventually pay him, pay him now. 
because it'll cost you less if you wait. And I give Dak Prescott credit because he he bet on himself. And the longer this is gone, the more money he is going to make. If you go back at the beginning and, man, I thought that they were going to sign him at the beginning of the season. I was told they're signing him. Over the weekend, they were going to be signing him. And didn't happen. And then didn't happen. And then we've heard nothing from Jerry Jones. He went radio silent. And now you've got D-Day tomorrow, but it feels like both sides probably know where the other side stands on all of this. And they could have prevented this problem by just paying him. Because now, if I'm Dak Prescott, I'll bet on myself again. Because Jerry Jones has put in place, it's not like he's playing for the Redskins. He's playing for the Cowboys. And Jerry loves to have that offense. And he's going to make sure he's got weapons. And he, he, he paid for the, you draft C.D. Lamb, Amari Cooper, Zeke Elliott, offensive line. All the pieces are in place for Dak to have another successful year. And it's going to cost you even more money. That's why I didn't understand the logic. And Jerry has been in so many negotiations that you think he would have the upper hand or know what to do. And Dak Prescott's people, his, his representatives, they said, don't cave in. Don't cave, you know, bet on yourself. And he did. Yeah, Paul. If you go to ESPN.com, they have the list of all the NFL teams and the standings from last year. You know, Oakland Raiders and New York Giants, it just says Washington. And there's blank. There's no logo next to it. There's nothing. Uh, they, uh, people have been told to scrub the name. NFL.com has not yet. Oh, they haven't? I have not. I checked it five minutes ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was told that uh, people uh, are, are being informed to scrub that nickname. But I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if, I, if I'm blaming Daniel Snyder for who, who sent out those possible names. Because that's where somebody trademarked all these potential nicknames here. And you would think if you go, hey, if we ever have to change the name, then let's look at the possibilities of names that we would be using and let's trademark those because it feels like there was public discourse on this. And then somebody goes, uh, anybody got these names? Like the to, to-do <laughs> list. Announce we're changing name. Trademark all name possibilities. And then, what's that? What order? Yeah. Wait, I forgot. Oh, oh I had it in reverse oh. order. And so you put them out there. I would have thought somebody would have gobbled them up. Not the case. Although when I first started this show and I left the mothership, I I didn't uh, trademark uh, danpatrick.com. Yeah, yeah. See. But to be fair, they're still learning lessons <laughs> at that phase of uh, development for this show. Yeah, that that that's when you know my boss was like, uh, uh, yeah, we got to trademark danpatrick.com, and I'm thinking God, it feels a little late. And then we of course ran into somebody who trademarked danpatrick.com. I had to call and uh, do a like a voice message. Seriously, yeah. So like he his settlement was a phone call from Dan. Patrick. Well, no, I think I had to. There might have been some other things involved, but yeah, I had to. Uh, I had to be nice, you know, you know be, to say thank you and uh, could could I have it back? Yes, Todd. If you had all these Washington names tra- <laughs> trademarked, what uh, number would you have in mind for not holding it hostage anymore and giving it? To the uh, Washington NFL franchise, I don't. If you know the guy, I guess is from Alexandria, Virginia. So I'm gonna guess season tickets forever. You know, four four season tickets. How's if they that? wanted that name bad enough, could you expect them to pay you a couple hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars? I wouldn't even know where to start. If they want that name and you're trademarking it, you're kind of holding them uh, in a really good spot there, and you know this team has millions of dollars. Yeah, but then they could say, well, this guy is holding on to this nickname that we want to use, use so we you know, we got to come up with another one. I, I mean, Daniel Snyder doesn't strike me as he's going to be going, hey, here you go. Can't wait to get that new nickname here. I think that's where you have lawyers and all of a sudden lawyers get involved in it. But I don't know what it's worth. It's only worth what you're willing to pay for it. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I was going to say, Daniel Snyder could just say, okay, we're going to call ourselves the Red Tails yeah. or... DC Red Tails, 
and get that website and you click on it. There's ways to put a different word for your website and get there and they'll get around this guy. This guy's got to be careful. He's got to make his deal now and try to get something decent. NFL teams who finished 500 or worse while outscoring the opposition by at least 100 points. Alex Trebek, your answers are the 1950 Philadelphia Eagles, the 1989 Bengals, and your 2019 Dallas Cowboys. Stat of the day, stat of the day, that past stat of the day, stat of the day. Here comes that what stat of the day. All three of those teams finished 500. That's one of those stats if you're Jerry Jones and you go, how did that happen? We had a great offense. My quarterback played great. And we finished 8-8 eight and eight in a division that had the Giants and the Redskins and a banged-up Philadelphia team. Well, thank God I picked the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl because I was going to pick the Cowboys to play the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. I picked the Eagles. But I, I was so bullish on the, the boys. <laughs> uh, and I had a scout who said, that's eh, fool's gold, man. I go, but they got it. They got the line. They got the, the Eagles. Fool's gold. I said, all right, well, I'll take the Eagles. Yeah, Paul. Cowboys were 6-4 and four, uh, around November 17th. And they lost New England, Buffalo, Chicago, three in a row. All close games. All one touchdown, about less than 10-point games. Buffalo was Thanksgiving? Right. That, that was really, that game told me everything about both of those franchises. Buffalo was real, and Dallas wasn't. Because my bold prediction that Buffalo was winning 10 games last year, and I thought, I, they, I can't see them beating Dallas in Dallas. And they went in there, and they were the better team. All right, we'll take a break. Close up shop after this. What we learn, what's in store tomorrow. We'll try to accomplish all of that next year on the Dan Patrick Show. Go back to the late 80s and just the concept of 24-7 sports talk radio. When you first heard... What was going to happen? What was your reaction to that? You know, I, I was amazed. I remember I was actually on a plane with Pat Musburger and uh, in my job where I traveled with him extensively uh, all the time. I mean, I was one of the Musburger mafia at the time, and uh, the concept came up, and he and I were discussing it or not, and to his credit, he thought it would work. I was skeptical and especially skeptical in a town like New York, because New York is such a big town, so diverse, so cosmopolitan, and so international. I wondered whether it could really take off. And uh, when they started it, I really, when I went in and met with them, I thought they were definitely going down the wrong road, because I knew bringing in strangers to New York would be a very hard sell. And it was an utter disaster for, for a while until they got on the right path and made it what it has to be, if you want to be really successful in a town, you have to be live and local. Otherwise, it's not going to work, especially in a town like New York. I mean, because it's a town that really, uh, believe it or not, takes to its own uh, very strongly. But when did you know you had something with, with uh, Chris? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, we both had had some success breaking through on our own doing solo shows in the six months leading up to the beginning of our show. They put us together against our will. We both wanted the afternoon drive. We knew they weren't renewing Pete Franklin. I was a candidate. Dog was a candidate. Both of us were working, doing stints on Imus in the morning. Uh, Imus favored Dog at the time more than he favored me. Uh, and so I knew the only way I could go was with him. We had a lot of people pulling us in opposite directions. Almost all of the station and all of the New York critics were against it. Every one of them thought it was a terrible idea. They wrote it was a terrible <laughs> idea. And frankly, the first couple of weeks, the reviews were awful. The guy who put it together, Mark Mason, thought he was going to get fired. He brought us in a room and said, listen, if you guys don't make this work, you're not going to be here and I'm not going to be here. And then we started a promotion called Dog Date Afternoon that he took to, which I give him credit for. He was single at the time I wasn't. We uh, petitioned people for dates. We put a whole thing together. He was a very good sport about it. 
it kind of softened everything. And really, though, Dan, it was more <laughs> result oriented than anything else. We got the first book back, and we had gone from 11th to third in the first book. And then it was, wait a second, what's going on here? By the second book, we were first by a mile. And then you knew it would, had taken the whole city by storm. So within six months, we had gone from it will never work, we hate each other, to we were the toast of the town. So then there was no looking back, even though we had some problems. And we always had problems because we were individuals that fought each other the whole time while we were a good team together. And that never ceased. But I think that also created a lot of the heat that created such a good show. All right, congratulations to Johnny in Oregon. He figured out the 42 and 24. Clue for 42 is Rookie of the Year gets new name. Rookie of the Year gets new name, 42, on this day in 1987. MLB Rookie of the Year Award now named after Jackie Robinson, who wore uniform number 42. For number 24, the clue is Junior Mint. Junior Mint, number 24, on this day in 1992. Ken Griffey Jr., who wore uniform number 24, named the MVP of the All-Star Game. So, new Rookie of the Year name for Jackie Robinson, number 42. Ken Griffey Jr., who wore number 24, All-Star Game MVP back in 1992. Johnny in Oregon, congratulations, buddy. How popular were you in a high school? I was... Famous. I was famous. I was famous to, but in a way that was attracted fights. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there was a lot of like I played. I played B basketball. That was for the guys who weren't kind tall enough to be, you know, play varsity at John Burroughs High School in Burbank. And you know, like they would play the Andy Griffith. If I had a shooting a foul shot, they play the Andy Griffith theme song. Da dun dun da da dun dun da. Miss it, Op. And so. Wow. It, there was kind of a harassment. When I would go back to school, there would always be a couple of weeks of sort of staking out your territory. And sports helped me with that. I mean, it was a kind of an equalizer. I wasn't great, but, you know, I was kind of co-captain of that team. I was good enough. I was a starter. I was good enough to sort of, you know, to, 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 to have another, you know, role, a function at the school. I also loved journalism. So I was co-editor of the school paper. So I, I got in there and kind of straddled uh, both of those worlds. But I was not, I wasn't like, popular in some sort of social way, but I was also not that interested in that. I wasn't really trying. I, I liked, um, you know, I, I already knew I wanted to be a director. I was kind of always had a, sort of a narrow vision and, and uh, kind of keep the eye on the prize. <laughs> What we learn and what's in store tomorrow, I think the uh, actor Jason Sudeikis is going to join us. He did uh, Hall Pass, <laughs> Horrible Bosses. He crushes in Hall Pass. Yes, very funny. So Jason Sudeikis will join us on the program tomorrow. And Todd working on a variety of things right now. Maybe Joe Theismann is going to join us as well. Is that right, Todd? That is correct, actually. Okay, all right. Uh, it's National Tape Measure Day. Yes, National French Friday Tape Measure Day, and Mac and Cheese Day. Ooh. Well, Seems that... a big tape measure guy. <laughs> yeah. I am. Yeah, I use the tape measure often. So you just, do you have <laughs> one that, that uh, clips onto your belt? No, I have one, though, that's usually I'll leave it in the pantry kitchen. No, so. Yeah. Just Do you do it because you need to do it, or you're just kind of are OCD about bringing out your tape measure? Well, I'm sort of... Uh, I, we have a lot of things that have to be done around my house. <laughs> and so I'm sort of always like, oh, yeah, what about this? Kind of like shiny things, you know? Like, oh, yeah, we have to fix that. I wonder how big that is. You know what I do, though? I guesstimate. So I won't measure. I'll go, yeah, that feel, yeah, it looks like it's about three and a half feet, something around there. And all of a sudden you bring something home and you're like, no, nope, that's four feet. Nope, I missed that by that much. Yeah, Paulie. The biggest Groundhog's Day thing I have at my house is my I, I have the tape measure out, you know, and I had the kids always say, hey, can, can we help? Can we help? I'm like, don't let it go. Don't let it go because you want to put the thing down. You yeah. kind of, sometimes I don't put the thing down. At least once every month they'll let the thing go and they'll snap back and tell almost take one of my fingers off. Uh, this day in sports history, um, any more fallout from uh, the mayonnaise 
McLovin? It's, did you survive yeah, social that, media? It's amazing. It's very polarizing. It's 50-50. Some people hate it. Some people love it. I have no use for mayo. None. Even so, you never order a turkey club sandwich. Because no. without mayonnaise, that is as dry as Sahara does. No, you put m- mustard on it. Wow. I, I put mustard on my turkey. But not a turkey club. You got a yes. turkey club with mustard? Yes. Yeah. Bit dry? No. Wasn't there something called Dijonese, and it was a mix of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dijon mustard and mayonnaise? Maybe right. you could sort of ease in with a little Dijonese. Mm, Surf and turfing. Yeah, I love Dijonese. <laughs> Dijonese. <laughs> See? You got to add something to make make mayonnaise good. I, I think you just like pronouncing it, McLovin. Yeah, although I have to be honest, I don't like when I get stuck with just Dijon mustard as an option. I like to see a stone ground or maybe a classic yellow in the mix. I don't know what your yeah. favorite French's. is. There's a lot of room in the mustard category. Category. Uh, yeah. Paulie, this day in sports history. It's a pretty good one. In 1969, U.S. President Richard Nixon signed a baseball from the Baseball Hall of Fame that had signatures of nine previous U.S. presidents. Hmm. That'd be pretty cool. Did anybody sign it after that? It's a great question. All right. Thank you, Paul. Find out tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Okay. That's about it. That's there, it? This is a very dry time of year for sports history. It's always like Bo Jackson hit a home run in the All-Star game. I think Shaq was traded to Miami this day in sports history. That's a pretty big one. Yeah. And then Fritzy had his scoreboard and... Uh, I'm sorry. That's the snoreboard. Snoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> snoreboard. 42 and 24. Yeah, so we had Jackie Robinson. Uh, they changed the Rookie of the Year award to the Jackie Robinson award? Correct. Okay. This date in history, I think, in 87. And then 24 was Ken Griffey Jr., All-Star Game MVP. This date in history. Okay. Was it this day in history when Reggie Jackson hit the light tower at Tiger Stadium? It was this week. I know. It was, I think it was, it was definitely, I think, in the last couple of days for sure. Well, this is when the All-Star Game is played, so. Yeah, I'm, let's I'm say assuming. It No one's going to check. That was still... That was one of those moments when, you know, you're a kid and you're watching the All-Star game and, you know, because the camera couldn't follow, Reggie would have hit it out of Tiger Stadium. And it was, and no one ever got uh, cheated on a Reggie Jackson swing, like, especially Reggie. Like, he'd corkscrew himself into the ground, but that ball hit the, and then they showed it, that where it hit in the stadium. And I just remember being, because Reggie had the, uh, those Oakland Aid uniforms, and uh, had the vest there, had the white shoes, and Reggie went up there, and Reggie went up there to do one thing, and that was to hit the ball as far as he could. You, you know, certain guys like that, you know, I wonder what Reggie would be like in today's game because it was an all or nothing with Reggie, and he, he hit some bombs. But that one at Tiger Stadium, that was a whole lot of fun. Was that off Doc Ellis? Does that sound right? The Pittsburgh Pirate? D-O-C-K, Doc Ellis? I think so. I Thank think you, you're right Tony. about that. Thank you, Tony. Uh, final results of the poll question. <laughs> if you could pay one of these guys $200 million for five years, Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, or Carson Wentz, 64% Deshaun, Carson, second place. All right. Uh, let's go around the room on what we learned on the program. What's it? I was getting ready for what I learned. Oh, oh okay. Like I learned that uh, Bruce Smith yells penis when he panics. <laughs> yeah, he said, you know, when you got a buzzer and you're on the clock, and of course, that's that's what came to mind. When Hammer. He... No, uh, penis. <laughs> <laughs> the best. Uh, Todd, what did you learn on today's program? You get the feeling the Cowboys still aren't sold on what they have with Dak Prescott. I don't, I don't know. And then I've had people say, well, why are they offering him a five-year deal? I think they're trying to get something that's a little more team-friendly there. I guess. Uh, McLovin, what did you learn? Bruce Smith came up with another option. He said wrench. We gave him a <laughs> yes. lot of credit. Yeah, he got it right. Wrench. Uh, Paulie, what did you learn? NBA writer Joe Varden not getting swole with any yard time. What did I learn, Todd? Joe Varden says of the Clippers, not the Lakers, the team to beat in the Western Conference. Uh, we're faced with new legal challenges, and legal help is uh, here for you with LegalZoom.com. Network of independent attorneys. Give you advice whenever you need it. And since they're a law firm, you don't have to leave your home. Don't charge you by the hour. LegalZoom.com for more information. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you tomorrow here on the Dan Patrick Show.